So actually, that, that's, I think that's a good place to start. All right, Dr. J, Mind Right, Sports Psychology. Psychology. And if you, I mean, obviously I know what you do. We've talked a lot about it, but like if, if you, when you sit down with someone or you're talking to someone and they're like, oh, what do you do? And they really I'm don't. I'm a scoundrel. And they don't know what you do. How do you explain it to people? Um, or what do you say? What? How do I explain sports psychology? Yeah, sure. Yeah, what is sports psychology? Okay, there's a misconception about sports psychology, I think, that it is about fixing problems, which that's only a fraction of it. Mm -hmm. For me, the majority of it is uh, fine-tuning the brain for performance. So it's an educational approach to fine-tuning the brain. Okay. So that's not, yeah. I mean, I guess with stuff I've, I've listened to and learned and, and read, lately over the past few years that's not super surprising but thinking about tuning the brain does sound a little bit i mean it seems like that is a newer concept for for us as humans is it or not well or am i just not connected with the uh, world? being intentional about it is probably not new i mean what do you call new but 50 years it's you know it's psychology it's when when we decided to that we have some control mm -hmm. so if you think about it, anxiety, depression, uh, poor performance, all of the mental things that are problematic are um, conditioned in our brain. So wouldn't it stand to reason that we could condition high performance? Okay. Yeah. yeah so it's part, part of this goo in our head is programming, genetic programming, experiential programming, um, family of origin stuff, you know, that we, that we get from experience. And so it can convince us we're, a, you know, a rotten egg or a good apple. Okay. Why can't it convince us that we're a pole vaulter or a skydiver or whatever else? Hmm. What, what has happened, when you say isn't it a new thing, what's happened is the primitive parts of our brain still operate on a catastrophe to misstep ratio. So if you get too close to that rustle in the bushes, something might get you. Mm -hmm. So now we don't have that fear anymore, but what we created is um, social events, you know, failure whatever it is, is now the rustle in the bushes that might want to get us. So we have this primitive anxious reaction to things, which isn't necessary. So we can condition our, we can decondition that programming and program the brain we want, the way we want. How is that connected to, I don't know why this is what it made me think of, but how is that connected to, it seems like there are some people who are more willing to admit when they're wrong and to, to learn from their mistake or just to learn from a, a wrong way of thinking. And then some people who are just like, it's so hard for them to, is that connected? I would say that's more on the experiential side. So what you're poking at is identity. So ego, and we tend to think of ego as like, I'm great, you know, but mm -hmm. ego is, is your sense of self. And so if uh, just generally speaking, if you go mm -hmm. through life um, being conditioned to feel small, you will, your ego will go and your identity, I'm the best at this, I'm whatever, you know, Donald Trump, perfect example, like narcissism wise. Um, so what happens is when we have this, this constructed identity, we will unconsciously fight to preserve it. So if your ego is uh, developed to hide uh, deficiencies, you're not gonna ask questions, you're not gonna admit you're wrong because that dents your sense of self. Okay, how would that, how would that belief about yourself or that, that way of thinking, how would that affect somebody in specifically in sports or an activity where you're trying to progress, you're trying to get better? Well, I could tell you're trying you, to improve. I see this every day. Uh, I see it happening with young athletes and their parents. And then I see the, the, um, the outcome of it with professional athletes or older people. It really starts with, uh, there's kind of an unwritten handshake. Like and parents don't mean it, but a message sent to their, their young athletes is if you perform well, I love you mm. because you know, the car ride home is about, you did so great or you did so bad. Mm -hmm. It's not about, Hey, I'm really glad that we got to have some nachos at the venue and what, whatever. And so we start their young athletes or young performer starts to build their identity on the praise that comes with high performance. So then, okay, well, part of my identity, and this is totally wrong. But part of my identity is I'm this high performer. Well, then you, in that ego way, you're going to avoid anything that ever tests oh, yeah. your belief in yourself. Yeah. 
And so that, that, that works academically. You start to, junior year hits pretty hard in high school. So people start to kind of fade off because, mm -hmm. oh, you're so smart. And all these things they've been told are now challenged. Mm -hmm. And if that, if they're wrong in that, they have no identity. Mm -hmm. I see it a lot when athletes get hurt, been playing football till they're, you know, 17, they blow out their knee and they can't play anymore. Who am I? Mm -hmm. All I ever was, all I ever got praised for was my athletic ability. Yeah. So the, the parenting trick there is you always want to praise effort, not outcome. Man, you really worked hard and it paid off. Okay, so how do you, all right, that, that's really good because I, that's what I, I was helping coach um, the junior high soccer at my, at my son's school. Mm -hmm. And then I was helping, I was just the assistant coach for both. And then I was helping with the high school. And the high school team, they had a really rough year. I mean, they really rough. I don't think they won a single game. <laughs> and I found myself at the end of every game trying to praise their effort, trying to encourage them because oh. like you lose over and over and over. That sucks, man. Like, yeah. It really sucks. Um, and the more that I would try to encourage them and praise their effort, it was almost like some of them, the more frustrated and angry they got. And I finally realized that I wasn't, I wasn't allowing them to be upset about losing. Okay. I, it was almost like I was invalidating their frustration and sadness at losing again. Uh -huh. And when I realized that, I actually was like, and maybe this was the wrong thing to do, but I actually apologized to the team. I was like, hey guys, I'm sorry. This is what I've been doing. And I basically said, I want you to know it is okay to be sad. Losing every game of a season does suck. It yeah. does. And sometimes people just want to hear, like, they just wanted to hear me as their, one of their coaches say, oh, this sucks, man. Yeah. You know? So how do, I, how do you do that? Whether it's a parent or a friend or your own self, how do you allow yourself to be frustrated and upset and sad when you lose or when you don't perform, but also not make that your identity like you're saying? Do you, you understand what I'm trying I, to ask? I, I do. The identity thing comes with repeated messages. And they're not, they're not usually um, overt messages, but it's, it's that invisible handshake I mentioned, like, hey, if you perform well, we love you. We talk more about that, whatever. Um, so the, the identity being built on um, performance is something that's being built brick by brick through time in a, in a family system, in a, in a sport system. What you're describing is a one-off moment where you're dealing with people's varying levels of identity in the sport. Mm. And it's, it's interesting, losing sucks, you're right. Like my daughter played volleyball uh, in the Y, and they're like, we don't keep score. That's not what it's about. Those kids know who won. You know what I mean? Oh, they keep score. Yeah, they keep, the kids keep yeah. score. Yeah, because yeah, the car ride home, they're like, we kick butt. So, yeah. And we, some of the parents definitely keep score. Of course, of course. So we, we want to win, and, and um, winning is not is great. That's the point of why we do stuff, I guess. But developmentally, the best thing is, from a parental perspective, is to praise that effort. So you're, you were um, insightful in catching that, okay, you know, they're having a bad reaction to this. Yeah, my encouragement is working the opposite of yeah, what I expected. So yeah, you're dealing with, a, you're dealing with a, uh, an egg that's already been cooked. Mm -hmm. So you, ha you, just, you did the right thing. You have to learn to pivot and go, okay, when, is, when can we, you know, when is sulking end? And then, well, let's use this as some, you know, to fuel something better. Yeah. That's a fine line. I think you did it all right, especially being um, r r being open enough to recognize the reaction. So, as a coach, what I would suggest is you are always consistent in your praise of effort versus praise of the outcome. It's super hard. Again, I have a kid who plays volleyball, and she's phenomenal in all aspects of volleyball. But I get excited by how many kills she has. And so, well, okay, babe, you have 15 kills, right? Yeah. Yeah, dad, right? So, but there was a game where she had 12 kills and somebody else had 16 and she felt like she did bad. But the 16 kills the other person got were all initiated by her pass. She, she wasn't there for that. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. She was outcome focused versus process focused. Mm -hmm. So that, that in the moment, she had a bad game and we had it, we debriefed after. Um, we, we, we are super outcome focused as human beings, but, but being, um, Getting good at recognizing that, that we want to go to the outcome, but to stay in the process helps. So as a coach, you help people stay in the process. They work hard on the process. The outcome will take care of itself. It okay. doesn't guarantee victory. Yeah. But you're, you're chipping, you're, um, 
building into somebody who's out, who's being cooked somewhere else yeah. at school, their family, their yeah. their so many different variables. Yeah. So if you're consistent with that, you might be um, counteracting some other negative thing that's maybe not even intentionally being instilled. But that's the best bet. That made me think of um, that guy. He's a Thai. I guess he's a kickboxer fighter. Um, oh, what's his name? Um, he's somewhat somewhat famous, but what he's really known for is that he's just like untouchable in fighting. He and and it's his reaction. It looks like his reaction times are just insanely fast. Yeah. I mean, because his opponents are always swinging at him, and he just knows how to just barely dodge every kick, every punch. Yeah. And um, and um, so some some guys got together and they started analyzing footage because they were like, how are his reaction times so fast? I mean, just so much faster than everybody yeah. else. And they started timing everything and they found out it wasn't. He wasn't any faster than anybody else. And so they started questioning like, okay, how is he doing this? He's not faster. What is he doing? And um, they ended up interviewing him and talking to him. And one of the things they found was that he, it seemed like he just truly didn't care if he won or lost. Like that's not why he was out there. He just loved being on the mat, being in the ring and fighting. Like the process, the, the, the time of like interacting with another fighter, it was so fun for him. Yeah. And when you watch him fight, he is so relaxed and just fluid. Like Bruce Lee says, you know, flow like water. Uh -huh. This guy was just like water. I mean, he just, yeah. cause he didn't, he truly didn't care whether he won or lost. He didn't even care if he got hit. He wasn't trying to not get hit. He was just having a good time, enjoying it. Um, I don't know why that, what you said, something you said made me think of that, the process. Oh, the yeah, process, yeah, like outcome focused. Yeah, the, the process is, I pro, like if, you're wor if your focus during performance is on the outcome, whether it's a score, whether it's being hit, whether it's winning, losing, you are not present in the moment. Mm. You're just not. Because you're like, you're halfway in the moment and you're halfway assessing how is this thing in the moment going to affect the outcome. So what you're saying is that guy is just there having fun fighting. It's in, like when you're saying that, I was thinking about another conversation with my kid where I was at a Texas Longhorn volleyball game. Yeah. On the floor, literally the players were in my way. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I texted her, I'm like, look at me. And she was like, I am so jealous. She was a little bit like mad, you know? Your and, daughter? And, yeah. And I was like, Okay, let's put this into perspective. You're mad that I'm in Austin, Texas watching uh, UT volleyball. Currently, you're in Santa Monica, California on the beach. <laughs> like <laughs> Playing volleyball. Yeah. Way better. Yeah, so be, you know, be in the moment where you are, not wishing you were in the moment I was. Yeah. Because as much as that UT volleyball game was fun for me, I would much rather have been in California. So we tend to not be present. Mm. It just in general, mm -hmm. which mindfulness is a huge part of what I do about being present in that moment. So what, yeah, you're, the, the thing you're talking about with your fighter is he's just free to perform because he's present. So if you really break that down to, to what we started this with, with the neurology and uh, um, how the brain is wired, he, he doesn't have competing signals. He doesn't have distractions. He doesn't have thoughts about anything. So he's just reacting. Mm -hmm. So training, training, training. All the time of thinking is in practice. It's very Bruce Lee. He just lets it go mm -hmm. in the moment, and he's better. Okay, so I, I definitely I want to talk about, well, there's lots of things, but I want to talk about the mindfulness thing in a second, and I also want to talk about coaching. Mm -hmm. But um, before that, you touched on something that I had, I had written down because I was writing down a bunch of thoughts and things that I wanted us to, uh, to discuss. And one of them... This is not exactly, but you know, you said your daughter, she was, she was jealous or upset that you were, I'm, I'm going to say it in a kind of a crass way is that she was mad that you were having a good time. Yeah. I mean, not really, that's, that's not really it, but she was mad that she was missing out on the there, good time. There you go. Yeah. That, that's, that's a good way of putting it. But what it made me think of the thing that I had written down is, um, how come, how come some people don't want to see others succeed. Like I have, I have some friends, you know, when they like, when they see me succeeding in some way, it doesn't matter. However, it doesn't matter. They're just so encouraging and supportive. And, and it seems like they are genuinely happy for me. Yeah. But then I have a, some other people and I hesitate to call them friends because it, they don't seem to treat me like a friend. Yeah. When, when I talk to them about something I'm doing or some good thing, or I, 
even invite them to be a part of something, it's almost like they're, they don't want to be involved. They don't want to participate. They don't want to, because they don't want to see other people do well. Yeah. Uh, I would say that goes back to the identity thing. So if let's say I'm the person who's like, I'm the person who's against you and you go, Hey, I did this thing and I'm so successful. Let's celebrate. Well, now I'm going, if my identity is constructed and not strong, and I'm really just kind of bolstering my weak feelings, I go, well, your success is a projection of my failure. Mm. And you'll find that the things that bother us about others are always a projection of our own weakness. Mm. It's what bothers us about ourselves. Yeah. Like we know, even if our ego was covering up the fact that we feel like a failure or whatever, Mm your success only highlights that for me in this ego, which then has this defense mechanism that's like, screw that guy. Mm. Yeah. We are not conscious of that, but you'll find this, you probably figured this out today. If you go through the day or the week and you come into contact with somebody that annoys you, bothers you, your, you know, your spouse, your kids, whatever. Well, maybe not your kids, but you, if you sit there and think about it, the thing that the the raw nerve is Mm -hmm. they're doing better than me at that thing. Mm. It doesn't make, it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human because it's a human reaction. Mm -hmm. It's the people that aren't willing to be aware of that and, uh, continue down the path of screw that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good because it seems like I've kind of noted, I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the different people who have been really encouraging and supportive Mm -hmm. in different areas. And so particularly with this, like this, this thing that I'm doing right now, Crave, it is, it is so much hard work. I mean, it is a ton of hard work. And most people don't see the hard work that you put into building something right. new, whether it's a business or a brand or whatever. It doesn't, you know, a, a practice, something like that. Um, people don't see the hard work. They don't see the effort. And we don't always post or share the hard work yeah. either. But what I've noticed when I talk to people, acquaintances or friends, um, the people that are the most encouraging and supportive are people that have worked their butt off at something else. <laughs> Who have gone? Who have just hustled hard, invested themselves, taken responsibility for their own life and their own actions, and are doing something not even huge, but significant for themselves. Yeah. They're working really hard, and they've had some measure of success. I'm not saying they're like huge, super famous people, but they've just worked hard and built mm-hmm. something themselves. And so it's almost like they recognize that and are a proud. It's almost like they're proud to have me as a part of the hardworking club. Mm-hmm. You sure. know, yeah. like. Yeah, I and think, it feels really good when people encourage that. You know, when they recognize you are putting in a lot of hard work, a lot of effort. Yeah, not, not it doesn't matter if it's a business or learning a sport or an activity or whatever. You know. Yeah, you, that, I like that you're part of the club. There, there was this uh, uh, a guy that I kind of admire in sports psychology is Michael Gervais. He has a very uh, popular podcast, Finding Mastery. Um, been doing his thing a long time. He's the sports psychologist for the Seattle Seahawks. R- really, really good guy. There was this uh, conversation that went on in uh, some social media that I was involved in at one point where it was about, it was over the phrase, game recognizes game. Mm-hmm. And people in the, in the dialogue didn't understand what it meant. And, mm-hmm. and kind of my contribution was that it was kind of like, if you're out in the savannah and a lion sees another lion, you're like... Yeah. You know, you just know we're lions, right? And so it's what you're saying, like game recognizes game. You're putting in the effort and that's recognized by people who put in the effort. Mm. And the converse of what you said is like you found that people who are similar are supportive. Well, the people that aren't supportive are the ones that aren't doing the hard work. Mm. They're sitting back and planning or wishing or whatever. And they then have to go, well, well, Chris is no good. Cause, cause really I'm no good. Mm. So there must be some problem with you, not some problem with me. Mm. That's that ego defense. Yeah. So then we have to build a story about why your success isn't earned or why it's not important or whatever else. Yeah. That's a, uh, you almost gave a commentary on our culture right now. <laughs> That's 100% yeah. of our culture. And it, there's, there would be an interesting correlation between those people, right? That you're talking about that aren't supportive and how maybe, uh, look at me, their social media is. Oh, okay. See, so like, mm-hmm. look at me, I'm here, I'm this, I'm important. Mm-hmm. Because social media is, is our highlight reel, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I don't post a bunch of stuff on social media. I don't post my successes, not because I'm somehow evolved. I just feel goofy doing it. Like, I, mm-hmm. like, I don't, I'm not comfortable. Look at me. Yeah. Uh, but the people like, so I guess there's probably a, a direct proportion of people who screw that guy. Look at me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think social media probably uh, has just sort of amplified um, or given, given a uh, free reign to small people who are very narcissistic because they feel small. Mm. And so that while I look at my highlight reel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So the, the mindfulness thing that we were talking about a minute ago, um, being in the moment, not focused, not overly focused on the outcome. Cause it seems like you can't ever completely get away from that. I mean, uh, my, I like to say this, it's not hundred percent accurate, but when you have an outcome, like a goal, mm-hmm. Or, or something, I want to win this game. Well, you, duh, <laughs> right? Yeah. You don't ever need to think that again. Yeah. You just need to be in the process. But if you have a goal, like I want Crave to be great, okay, set the, whatever that goal is, be specific, set it, then forget it. And I, I, it's my lily pad theory is what I call it. If you, if you think about Crave's raging success as the lily pad across the pond, when you're way over here, you, you strain your eyes to see it. It's too far. It's demotivating. It's, mm. it's you know, discouraging. Yeah, it's demoralizing. It's so, so far, so much to do. Right. And so we tend to then get caught up in our story about the difficulty, uh, not be, uh, you know, motivated, whatever. So, so let me, let me, this is the one, the way that I usually describe this. It's, it's a little easier. Imagine you wanted to lose 50 pounds. You don't need to, I do. <laughs> and you 50 pounds, like that's so many calories. That's so many, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, you just got to map out the 50 pounds is the, the lily pad across the pond. You, you map out the steps in between real hard to lose 50 pounds. Super easy to have a salad for lunch and go to the gym tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know 50 pounds is my goal, but I don't ever have to think about it again. I just have to have a salad and get to the gym. Mm. And then tomorrow, salad, gym, salad, gym. That's easy. And before you know it, you're halfway across the pond and it, the, the thing across the pond is so much closer. Yeah. And there's another problem when people are so outcome focused as far as goal setting, you can't measure steps. You can't measure, measure progress. So if you have these lily pads set out of like, okay, in six months, I want this done, or, or I want to go to the gym today and have a salad and you don't, ah, right there in real time, in the moment, you can figure out that tipping point between the lily pads Mm. of what talked you out of it or into it. And you learn what talks you out of stuff and you get conversations that beat that. Yeah. And you learn what talked you into it and you'd repeat those. Yeah. Jordan Peterson, he talks about like the positive feedback loop. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we always, people a lot of yeah. times talk about the downward spiral. Sure. What about the upward spiral? Yeah. That's one thing he says. Like that's that's um, what that's the same underlying science. Yeah. And there's an interesting even neurological underpinning of that, which is if I have a salad for lunch, okay, all right, I'm on my goal. Yeah. If I have a cheeseburger and I don't have increments and it's 50 pounds away, ah. I'll make it up, right? Yeah. But I go, wow, I blew it right here. What talked me into it? Well, I didn't have groceries and Wendy's was on the way home. Mm-hmm. Okay. <sighs> Vulnerability, right? Yeah. So, but then, then, so anyway, I have the salad. I go, hey, I did pretty good. I'm on it today. All right. Little burst of dopamine. Okay. Which then gives me motivation to go to the gym. I'm feeling pretty good. Mm-hmm. So now I had a salad and went to the gym. Mm-hmm. Motive, uh, uh, dopamine for both. Because dopamine is the pleasure chemical. Hey, you get a little pleasure, yeah. but it's, it's also the chemical of learning. So our brain goes, hey, that produced a favorable result. Let's do it again. Mm. So it's pulling you along. It is also the chemical of more, wanting more. If you have a chip, you want another chip. If you have a salad and go to the gym, you want that more. Mm-hmm. So that's the positive feedback loop. And where does, in serotonin, some, some, doesn't that play an effect Yeah, but, well? I, but I think as far as goal meeting and accomplishing small steps, dopamine's where it's at. Okay. Because dopamine also works in the other way. If I decide to have uh, a burger today, that's pretty freaking good. <laughs> I, mean, <you laughs> I know, think I got a hit of dopamine just thinking about so, it. <laughs> so my, my, um, my ultimate goal, hunger, like satisfying hunger is achieved, mm-hmm. but then there's this negative consequence. I feel bad, like, uh, you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. Um, s- serotonin is, is, a, is a neurotransmitter that, that is involved, but it's dopamine that's pulling you yeah. in, in either direction. If you're stressed after work, it's great to go to the bar and have a few drinks. 
It takes the stress away. Yeah. But there's a hangover, your spouse is mad at you. Mm -hmm. But still dopamine is pulling that along. Mm -hmm. So you have to get you have to build uh, habit loops that uh, reward that have behaviors that get you towards that goal across the pond. Habit loops, what explain that? That's what you're talking about about the, the feedback loop. Oh, okay. It's a habit. There's a there's a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. Trigger, I'm hungry. Behavior, I either eat a salad or I eat a burger. And the reward is either, hey, I've moved towards my goal, or it's, oh, I really blew it on my goal today. Uh, and then maybe I have another burger for dinner because I feel that. Mm. But that's still, when you repeat that, dopamine's telling you, let's keep doing this, you'll go down the wrong way. Yeah. The measurable, measurable success, like being able to measure it, you were talking about that a minute ago. Yeah. Um, I posted a video, I think last week or whenever, it's talking about whenever, specifically in skydiving, when we're trying to learn new skills, like I'm trying to learn how to do something new, uh -huh. or I'm working with someone, I'm trying to teach them how to do something, um, I was encouraging people to break it down into its tiniest pieces. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the most minute skills, like body flight skills or whatever it is, as tiny as you can, uh, because then you can actually watch the video, like you jump and you have your friend video you or whatever, you can actually look and say, okay, am I doing a, B, and C, or not, versus like this idea of angle flying. It's a, it's a type of flying. Am I angle flying? Well, no, yes. I mean, kind of, yeah, but not very good. No, you did bad. Well, it's hard to evaluate. And then what do you need to do better? Well, everything, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Versus if it's like the small pieces of skill that make up angle flying, like what does that take? What are you actually doing? Yeah. Am I, like for example, de-arching a little bit? Am I breaking my hips? Am I keeping my legs straight? Am I actually steering with my shoulders? All these little things, you can actually evaluate and critique yourself and say, am I actually doing those steps, those things? Which is what I kind of heard you saying. Yeah, you, you, took, you took that model into a very specific behavior, which is great, it works. But you're also, uh, the method you're describing is playing on neurology as well in that it's it, the sports psychology way of saying it would be deliberate learning. So you're taking the components of this behavior, it, whether it's skydiving or playing sports or, you know, it doesn't Learning matter. a card trick or whatever. Yeah. Um, what we tend to do as humans is uh, practice the thing we're good at. Right, And yes. then kind of not do the thing we're not good at. Absolutely. So deliberate learning, you're breaking um, the thing down into chunks and you master each chunk. So you may be real good at de-arching, but real bad at angle fly or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know the terminology. So work on the thing you're bad at till it's comparable to the thing you're good at mm. and then you string those together. Yeah. And neurologically in your brain, you're creating little clusters of neurons that are each behavior. Hmm. And so one is really firing on all cylinders and the others aren't. We'll get them all up to speed and then put them together as a complex movement. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Olympics, Simone Biles, I guess, is such a gym, such a, uh, her, her ability as a gymnast is so amazing that they had to like change how they score, right? And like whatever. And so then she had to pull out because she couldn't land her tricks. And that's what happened, I think. I mean, I'm not in her head, but her tricks are so fast and so complex that she doesn't, she has these little clusters of neurons that are all perfectly aligned into one chunk or one, one um, behavior. And those came unlinked and she had to start thinking. Yeah, whereas previously she didn't even have to think about didn't it. She just initiated the process and it, so, like her body took over. Kind exactly. Of. So something goes wonky and now she's having to think about specific movements and you can't do that going 400 miles an hour upside down. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's why we deliberate practice is so important. Mm. And that's when something goes totally south. That's usually why is because we, we interject thinking into what is an automatic behavior. We were talking about doing the, we focus on the thing we're good at. Mm -hmm. Right, or you said something like that. Like, yeah. we practice what we're good at because it feels good. Yeah, because it's easy. Yeah, right. Um, I, I would see that when I was working at, at the tunnel at iFly, and I would see it in myself and the other instructors and people that we would coach, our friends, all sorts of people. Um, there's the the most obvious skill. I mean, obvious example is there's a thing we call it's called carving. So you you got your head down and your feet up and you're carving around the tunnel. And you can either be facing inward so that you're kind of on your back in a sense, or you can be facing outward so you're kind of on your belly. Um, and so inevitably, I mean, I'm going to say 
I'm going to say 100% of the time, but probably not. But almost. People, for whatever reason, people are, it's easier for them to carve one direction. Like when they first start learning that skill, for some reason, it's just easier to go one way than the other. Mm-hmm. And it's not like everybody is easier the same way. It's different for everybody. Sure. But uh, I mean, there's only two choices left or right. So um, what would happen is somebody would get really good at going one direction. And then we'd try to teach them to go the other direction. They just had a terrible, terrible time. It'd be so hard. So that was one of the things as when we were coaching and helping someone learn, instructing someone, I would always tell them like, as soon as they started being able to do do it one way, I mean, I wouldn't even wait till they could do it. They have to go practice both directions yeah. from the beginning because it also seems like you, you kind of develop this mental block when you can only do it mm-hmm. one way or you have these, it's like competing, like mm-hmm. your muscles learn how to do it one way. And so then when you try to do it the other, other your muscles are, are fighting against themselves almost. Yeah. So there's a lot to, to talk about in that. One is your muscles aren't doing anything about responding to a signal from your brain. Okay. So people go muscle memory. Yeah. Right. What they mean is they're clusters of neurons. So that's not muscle memory is not a thing. No. Okay. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> your muscle. If you put electricity there, will contract. Okay. It doesn't, it's, there's no memory in your it muscle. It doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, remember in science, like you, you put electricity through a frog leg and it was like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it, there's no muscle memory there. I mean, muscle memory is the thing cause we all say it. Yeah. But what, but really, not like how we conceptualize it. Yeah. What really is going on is, um, our muscles are getting a, a signal from our brain and these behaviors that are already programmed. Okay. So what well, you, but, uh, I mean, uh, okay. Just to argue with that, like, let's say a specific movement. A specific movement requires my muscles to move in a certain way at a certain time in conjunction with one another. Yeah. So I mean, could I not argue that those muscles are, <laughs> I mean, they're that particular movement, the way the muscle has to move and the way that it, because if I, if I do my arm like this, that's different. Even if I just turn my wrist yeah. and that's a, I act, activated my muscle differently. So you, I activated my muscle differently. Okay. Do you hear it? Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. So if, if we just ripped your arm from its socket right now, <laughs> we could do all of those movements. Yeah. It needs a, it needs something giving it a direction. Okay. Okay. That's what you see. Saying. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, uh, the favoring a direction thing that goes back to neurology too. It's like throwing a ball with your non-dominant hand, right? Mm-hmm. It's, there, there, it's not, there's no neurons for that. Yeah. We have this dominant hand, this favorite. And so that's, what we favor. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, I don't know if there would be a direct correlation with what you're talking about in a, in a wind tunnel of like, if I'm right handed, I want to go right or whatever, but the brain has a preference and, and it, the brain is, uh, this will probably come up again. The brain is not in our head to make us happy. It's there to keep us alive. And so there's, uh, lots and lots of brain biological evolution that wants us to do the simplest, safest maneuver. And so we are, we are like on a railroad track going Mm -hmm. towards that thing. And so the reason people struggle to go the other way is because they're having to build that behavior through, through new clusters of neurons. Mm -hmm. It's great that you, the second they get it one way, you start teaching in the other because that's now using the brain more, Mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no mystery behind it. It's preference because our brain wants to consolidate everything. So it has resources on hand to help us survive. And it seems like, and I could be, I could be just wanting, wanting this to be true. So this is what I see, but it seems like the people who are, who are more willing to work on the heart, the, the weak side, mm-hmm. it seems like they actually progress quicker yes. and learn more and end up, end up being better overall. Yeah. What you're poking at there is growth mindset versus fixed mindset. So it may be not directly, but a, a person with the growth mindset does not see skills, abilities, and talents as fixed. This is all I'm going to be able to do. This is the best I can do. They, they see a challenge and they approach it. Mm. And so they, uh, uh, for fun, oh man, I can do it this way. It's real hard that way. Let me try it that way. Yeah. And you'll find that the reason they do better is because they do that in all facets of their life and they explore and they question and they're flexible mm. versus no, I can't do that. I'm not good at that, mm-hmm. whatever. So that's, that's what you want to be. You want to approach challenge versus avoid. What about humility and like a willingness to actually take input and learn from others? You know what I mean? Cause that's, yeah. I, I've seen some people who are phenomenal at a certain 
thing, sport or activity or whatever, doesn't skydiving or not, doesn't matter. I mean, there's people who are just, and they seem cocky and arrogant and like they don't seem to be willing to listen or learn from any, but they're phenomenal. And then there's these people who are, seem very humble and down to earth and, and accessible and willing to learn and they're awesome too. Like yeah. you'd almost think that, or I would kind of think if someone wasn't willing to be humble, wasn't willing to learn from others, they wouldn't be able to reach that level. But maybe, maybe those people who, who aren't humble, maybe they could be even better if they were willing to, I don't know. Well, yeah, that's, that's a philosophical question, what you just said. But I think what you're talking about is some people's personality is this and some people's personality is that. And then they acquire skills at whatever they're into and it works however it works. Mm. But those people that are arrogant and whatever else that are unteachable, you don't have to be humble to be great at something. Yeah. But a, a humble approach, a beginner's approach, even if you're an expert, is probably more well-rounded. Mm. But, I, but I would even say probably the people who uh, are arrogant and not, don't have humility are probably humble to someone. Because mm. they wouldn't have had something to, to model to get to where they are. Mm -hmm. But they, I think, maybe just might think that it's the, the, the normal people are below them. And it's not like I'm unteachable. It's just I'm not teachable by you. Yeah. <laughs> well, which might be true. <laughs> yeah. Probably is true. Sure. But, but, but it's funny. I was uh, many years ago uh, at going to, I guess, Bible school. Um, the, uh, this old, wise, you know, learned professor I had big he's very very baptist slicked back white hair and this big presence i was like does it ever get boring to you like knowing like this doctoral level of bible knowledge does it get boring to you in sermons and stuff when people are just mailing it in and he goes he goes no i always get something out of it and i was like oh wow life lesson there to not to not go that's the approaching as a beginner even if mm. you're an expert right mm -hmm. that's not to go oh here we go yeah you know sermon on the mount again yeah it's to go hey how is this guy going to deliver it yeah, which is which is I, I really have taken what that man told me all that the, those years ago. So when I listen to something uh, or, or I seek out things or I read more books about mindfulness or, or psychology or self-talk or whatever, and I may not be getting a lot of new information, mm -hmm. but I'm getting more texture mm -hmm. of how to deliver what I know to people to help them. Mm. So there's, there's always room to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I maybe fight, the, probably this is my projection, I, pro I probably fight being taught sometimes. I put value in figuring things out on my own. Oh, yeah. Because I was f forced to. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess. I mean, that's the story I tell about it. I, when I was younger, I was on my own a lot. Uh, we lived overseas, and I would just walk through woods and uh, mountains and to the beach every day, and I was always in my head. And I think the story I tell now is that I didn't have much help. I probably could have gotten help if I asked. I just liked figuring stuff out. Mm -hmm. So as an adult, it's, I've had to sort of embrace finding teachers. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about, like you're we talking about the uh, lack of humility and being able to be taught, there's so much texture that can be got or, or got, does that doesn't sound right? So much texture in other people's experience, mm -hmm. even if you're at the same skill level. They mm -hmm. went about it a different way. So you can scaffold what you know because cause somebody else experienced it. And you can just steal their experience from them. Yeah. Because they, they, um, they just summarize you know, their lifetime of experience. You go, hey, thanks for that information. And you just put it into your hard drive and now their hard work is part of your texture. Yeah, you, you just perfectly described crave like what we're trying to do with crave we've got these skydivers these people who have spent years and and not to mention financially but their their investment of time and energy and themselves and what they've learned and accomplished in different disciplines and in, in the thing that they do i mean for one thing i just think about all of the knowledge and experience that is that's represented in these different people these instructors that we're working with and i just think man at some point, all of those people won't be around anymore. Yeah. And that knowledge, that experience, all of that information is going to be lost. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really sad. That's sad. Yeah. Like, oh, that's sad. So, so part of it is honestly just for posterity. I mean, just to pass on this really good information to as many people as possible, make it available. And that's what we're trying. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do is like, this is really, really good information. We can all 
we can, all of us, whether you're, no matter what level you're at, you can learn something from these people mm -hmm. and you can bypass a lot of mistakes, yeah. Yeah. a lot of heartache, a lot of danger, sure. possibly save your life and just have more fun because you'll be better. You know, like you can, yeah. but it, it's, it is interesting how some people are immediately, they see the value and are super excited and want access. Like I, I gotta, this is so awesome. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. Like they are so thrilled at what it means for them. They, they see it. And then some people are just like, eh, eh, that's cool. Like, mm -hmm. I, and I don't know why, like one, one of the guys that it just blew me away. He's, he's actually one of our instructors. He is, a, a super accomplished flyer, like one of the best vertical flyers, free flyers in the world. Like he's phenomenal. Champion, all this stuff, been on world records, a lot of really, really cool stuff. And the first time I met him, I was talking to him and telling him about Crave and what we were doing and asking him if he would want to be involved in, and teach a course. His response was, dude, I need access to this. I want to learn from, and he started yeah. naming the other instructors. Being like, I want to learn from so and so. Yeah. I want to learn. He's like, this is awesome. Can I, can I get access to? I want to watch the course. And it just blew me away because this guy is at a level, a skill level that is, most of us will never attain that yeah. level. But yet he was so excited to yeah. try to learn from all these other people's experiences. I, it, it was so awesome for me. Yeah, I would think that would even go back to on a, an unconscious level being process oriented. He's mm. not going. You, Chris, you think I'm great. That's why you're approaching. He's going, what? Those guys? Yeah. Awesome. Like he's thinking about how he could, um, when he is skydiving, how he can be better, do better, no more. He's not thinking about his standing in um, the, you know, the, the hierarchy of yeah. ability. He's yeah. thinking, man, I just like to, to jump out of planes. How could I do it better and have more fun? Yeah. Which is if, if you could approach life and everything in life that way, even the stuff you don't want to do, you'd mm -hmm. be so much better off. Mm -hmm. the, the process stuff uh, that you were talking about a while ago, you made me think of that book. Um, I think it's called Seven Days in Utopia. Don't know it. Um, it's, a, it's about golf. It's a golf book. My dad gave me a copy of it. Um, it, is, it is an excellent, excellent book. Super easy read. I mean, it's just like a, it's a fictional self-help kind of, I guess. Um, but really, really good. But one of the things he, he talks about, the character is learning from this other guy how to be a better golfer, but it's really not even about, it is about golf, but it's more about mindset and mindfulness and being in the process, mm -hmm. yes. not the outcome. And so he, he works with this, he's a, he's a professional golfer, the main character is a professional golfer, and he's really struggling. He's kind of hit this, this block and he's at this tournament, he just completely falls apart. And so he's like ready to give up on golf. And he ends up meeting this, this old rancher guy. The rancher guy helps the, the professional golfer just learn how to focus on the process of making a good golf swing. Like what is a good golf swing? What is he supposed to do? And practicing that, feeling it, but then he gets him to the point where he stop, like you were talking, he stops thinking about moving his muscles in the right way and doing all this stuff. He just feels it and does it and trusts that the process, because he's practiced it over and over yeah. and over, just relax and let his body do what it's supposed to do. Just trust that it's going to work. Yeah. And um, it, it's a really interesting, interesting. I mean, there's lots of other like li good life lessons in the book, but um, it's really interesting. Like as far as like the process. Yeah. There's golf is a great example because it's so so fickle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you could crush it, and then the next one it's straight into the woods. Yeah. It's like, ah. And the the only thing that matters in golf is that that club face comes through square on the ball. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can have a lot of technical stuff, mm -hmm. but, but uh, my father-in-law, when he, he was an incredible golfer, never, never beat him, uh, tied him once, but never beat him, <laughs> old man. So he, I, could, I would literally crush a drive 320 yards, yeah. uh, a little bit out into the fringe, right? <laughs> He'd hit it 250 right down the middle yeah. and, you know, birdie the hole and I'd get like a bogey. Because <laughs> he could bring the club face of the square. Yeah. I could hit it hard. So it's, it's like the task at hand in a golf swing is that ball coming, that ball being hit with that club face square. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. And then you, you're 100% right. You don't have to worry about the outcome. Hopefully you chose the right club. You'd repeat that swing. Mm -hmm. The outcome takes care of itself. That's mm -hmm. a perfect example. 
and we do groove in those behaviors, but we also groove in bad habits. And then we, then we start to think it's like some own bios. You start to think, well, I, I pushed that a little, maybe I should. Uh. Yeah. And now, well, okay. That, uh. yeah, exactly. My brother-in-law has a uh, real bad slice. So he'll, <laughs> he'll line up to accommodate that slice. Yeah. And so occasionally he swings so hard, his club will clip the ground and it causes his club face to come through square. So he'll hit it 300 yards. Like <laughs> where he's aiming. Yeah, three, <laughs> three fairways over. <laughs> you know, Cause it's become so convoluted yeah. in his head yeah. versus just trying to bring that thing through straight. Mm-hmm. And then, then ego plays a big part in everything, but yeah. especially in golf, you're like, well, I'm gonna hit my driver. Okay, it's gonna either go 150 yards because your slice is so bad, or it's going three. Just just hit the five iron right up the middle and see what yeah. happens. You know, so so ego is a whole other part of all of this. Yeah. So with sports psychology, whenever, how, how do you help? How do you help yourself get over that? Like, let's say I'm I'm on the plane ride to altitude, mm-hmm. and me and my friends or whatever we've planned a certain type of jump. We're gonna do a certain thing, and if um, if we're just talking and goofing around on the way to altitude, sometimes I actually do better on the jump because I don't have, I don't think about, mm-hmm. we've already talked about it on the ground, we did a dirt dive, we walked through it, we've planned it, we know what we're gonna do. And then on the plane ride, we're just talking and laughing and having fun versus it's quiet in the plane and I'm thinking so hard about it. Or I'm, I'm, maybe I'm jumping with people who are at a higher level than me and I really want to impress them. I, I just want to, I, do, I want to do well because I yeah. don't want them to, I don't want to mess up the jump or I want them to like me or whatever, you know? Sure. Um, how, do you, how do I help myself get out of that when I'm stuck thinking too hard about, oh, I got to do this on the exit, I got to do this, I got, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm thinking so hard instead of just relax and fly. Yeah, so you, you're back into mindfulness. So you're on the plane ride up and everybody's having fun. That that's your present. Yeah. Uh, your tendency, and it's the tendency of the brain because of this old survival mechanism to time travel to the future Yeah. and play the future over a thousand times to like scan for danger, look for mistakes, see how we'll be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And then you're even now telling the story about it. These guys are so much better than me. Yeah. So you're time traveling. Mm-hmm. Or you time travel backwards. Oh my gosh, if this is like last time, what's going to happen? So staying present. So the way, f- f- I mean, if you came to my office for help with that, the way that it would be was like you finding ways for you to be present. Mm. The, the best way and the thing that I teach people the most is to check in on your senses. So in my office, I'll say, how do you know you're here? And they'll go, well, because I drove here. Well, that's just the story you're telling about why you're here. But you could be at Starbucks after this. That's still the story. You drove here. That's not evidence you're here. Mm-hmm. So I go, I'll, I'll say, well, you know, what do you notice in this room? Well, I can see you. Okay. So you, you, you visually, you see something. What do you feel? Uh, anxious? No, 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 no. Like, what do you feel physically? Mm-hmm. How do you know you're on that couch? And people will always go, because I'm sitting on it. Again, that's the story about the couch. That's not what you feel. Yeah. So then, I, no, no, that's the story. What do you feel? I feel uh, the cushion. No, that's what you're sitting on. What do you feel? It's pressure in my butt, pressure in my legs, pressure in my, okay, now you're on it. Now you're in that moment. Mm-hmm. I feel this. Mm-hmm. What do you hear? And most people go, I hear the clock ticking or I hear a truck, you know, out on the street. Okay. Remind me about the truck too. Very interesting thing about mindfulness that happened to me the other day. Um, Okay, so now you're getting it. You check in on your senses. You recognize your time traveling, check in on your senses. So if it's you on the plane right up, wiggle your toes in your shoes. Mm-hmm. You cannot be focused on your toes in your shoes and be time traveling. Okay, you, I'm, you, I'm wiggling my, I'm thinking about wiggling my toes right now. Yeah. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, you're, ti- you're exactly, you're time traveling. Uh, so the brain cannot do two things at once. And people go, well, I multitask. No, no I you don't. don't. I don't, I'm horrible at it. Multitasking is not a thing, it's not real. It's like muscle memory. If, and people go, oh, oh, I could do it. Okay, if you can do it, sing me two songs at once. You can't. Mm. You're, you can quickly vacillate from this thing of attention to this thing of attention, yeah. but you're half-assing both. Yeah. So what, you're, what we're talking about with mindfulness is mindfulness is the ability to bring your attention to the present, fighting off the gravity that the past and the future have. Because that survival brain is like, let's find danger and make sure we're safe, especially mm-hmm. if you're going up in a plane, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's built in. So we have to train ourselves to pay attention to the present. That mm-hmm. doesn't just happen. 
Okay, how, how, do, I, how, do, how do we balance that with, um, oh, what's the word, just left, oops, left me, but um, like uh, we're, we're on the plane ride mm -hmm. and I'm, I take time, I stop and I take time to like envision and think through the jump and imagine and seeing myself performing the jump well. Mm -hmm. Like, because that, that is a thing that a lot of people talk about, and not just in skydiving, but in, in lots of sports. Yeah, like visualization. Visualization, that's the word I was looking for. Like visualizing yourself doing this thing the right way. Yeah. Right? Like, so how does that? That's great. That's not the question you asked, though. That's not time traveling? That's different? It's, um, well, let me, let me first differentiate the original question. Sometimes I'm worried about these things on the plane right up and okay. sometimes i'm present laughing right visualization is a chosen you putting your attention on what you choose okay so in that present moment you're choosing to mentally practice that's different than time traveling to what if i make a mistake gotcha. what if i screw this up yeah 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 and the brain doesn't really know the difference between what we do and what we think so, which is why anxiety is a killer because we are imagining this monster outside the door over and over. It becomes mm -hmm. real. It's, mm -hmm. it's just imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. If if you're home alone and you hear a thump, you're like, okay, either there's a ninja, <laughs> right? I mean, there could be. Could be. It's plausible. <laughs> they exist. Like there is such a thing. Like, are you so like great that <laughs> that you can handle a ninja? Yeah, that you're above ninjas? I don't think so. Could could be your dog, right? Your mind goes to a story. But like then, then the story gets even worse. If it's midnight, you're home alone and everything. Oh, it's dark. definitely a ninja. Yeah. So you're like, I'm just not going to go there because there's some monster. Yeah. Could have just been, you know, who knows? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we get caught up in these negative stories. Choosing to uh, practice visually, that's also aligning those neurons, just like real practice. So that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. But that's, you, that's you've good. got that's control helpful. of your attention because the time travel to these monsters and these, these fears has an emotional, a psychological and a physiological reaction in the present. Mm. If you're worried about this thing, you're having a, a this is where, where golf or whatever else, when the thoughts get involved, Simone Biles, you're going, what if I mess up? Now your attention is on what if I mess up? Your body tightens, anxiety comes, adrenaline gets more. Uh, and then you're in trouble. And that, so that, it seems like that's more focused on the outcome, whereas the, the mental practice is more focused on the process. Yeah. yeah. Is that? I'm, yeah. And even like, let's say that part of your pr process is visualizing the jump going 100% right on the plane right up. Okay. Well, that's part of your process. Mm -hmm. That's easy. But if you're, if you go, I'm going to get on the plane and see what happens. Your, yeah. The gravity of the human brain is likely to pull you to the worst case scenarios about stuff. Yeah. So yeah, you're just. So I could I could almost use that that visualization technique as a trigger for the positive, uh, uh, physiological relaxing, 100%. breathing, feeling, being in the moment. Yeah. Like, let let it get, let it trigger a positive. Yeah. Thing. Let me give you an example <clears throat> of this. <laughs> I'll, I'll do example too because you'll appreciate it. Sometimes, if I want to laugh, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling stressed. I'm feeling down. I'll watch. Uh, the blooper reel from Step Brothers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just mentioned the blooper reel from uh, Step Brothers, and you start laughing. Yeah. You had a physiological lift. Yeah. Not even watching the blooper reel. Just hearing, hearing you talk about it. it. <laughs> yeah. So you have the the ability to draw up that physical lift mm. anytime you want. Mm -hmm. What happens with us is we are so constantly bogged down in our negative assessment of things mm -hmm. that we're having a down or having a depressive mm. reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I usually tell is I like to watch videos of cats jumping but missing the landing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. But see, you're laughing. Well, because I hate cats. So I want to see <laughs> oh, it's the best. Because you know they're like they're cats, right? They're like, so look cocky. At me. And then they just <laughs> yeah. It's it's glorious. Put them in their place. I love it. So again, you you're not even watching the video, but you laugh. You belly laugh. Yeah. So think about the power of the psychology if you program in the physical feelings you want to have. Mm. And then you imagining, visualizing a perfect jump mm -hmm. is bringing those feelings up. So feel those feelings too. Mm -hmm. Part of sports psychology, one of the things I have athletes in the slump do is watch their highlight reel. Because they all have it because they're trying to play college or whatever. And they go, oh yeah, I remember. I'm good. I this, I that. Oh yeah. There's a lift that comes from so you, you have control of that. Mm -hmm. And you're, again, if you're going, oh man, these guys are better than me. What if I screw up? What if I'm embarrassed? 
your ability to perform like that TIE fighter you were talking about is diminished because you're drawing in something that's kind of squishing down your uh, physical mm -hmm. and emotional being. Yeah. So what, what was the truck thing? Okay, this is a perfect example of mindfulness. We haven't really talked about mindfulness. Mindfulness is being present in the moment, right? Without negative assessment of the, it's accepting the moment. Well, I'm about to jump out of a plane. <laughs> so my choice, okay, let's do it. I accept it, right? It's about assessing, not going, this is terrible. And so we are very quick to jump into stories about things. Instead of dealing with reality, we deal with mental models. Mm. Our, our, our experience in life, uh, creates our mental models. Okay. So I'm walking at the park and I have to try to be mindful in my walk. That's why I walk because I tend to go, well, I walked four miles today. I got to do five tomorrow or else I'm a loser. I go, no, the point is to be out here. The point is the process, not the outcome. So I go, okay, let's bring this back to being mindful. So I'm listening to my feet. And then I was in this thought of like, it's weird that I think I hear them as different noises, but they're the same noise. Mm. It, feel, it feels like it's like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. but then I analyze, no, it's whoosh, 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 same noise. Well, interesting. And in the middle of that ridiculous, who cares notion, <laughs> I hear beep, beep, beep off in the distance. And then ka, 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 ka. And I go, oh man, that's one of those big like excavator trucks that has a jackhammer on it, probably digging through rock, whatever. And yeah, that, that noise is... I'm in a story about that noise. Mm -hmm. It's a mile away. I can't see it. Mm. But like that, I'm pretty sure what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm probably right, but that is the thing about how the stories we tell, our narrative is not, we are quick to go to our narrative and get out of what's actually happening, out of the present and out of reality. Mm. So I would have told the story. Yeah, I heard one of those trucks earlier. I, I don't know that, you know? What do you mean? I don't understand. I, I don't know. I, I heard it. I didn't see it. Oh, oh I see. I, I pictured in my head a red truck <laughs> digging out a hole in the ground. Yeah. It could have been a yellow truck uh, hammering a foundation. I don't know. It could have been a pile of cement that the last crew left. At their t but I was quickly into the story about a red thing. Okay, and that beep, beep, beep is a truck pulling, back, pulling up to load the rubble. In. Yeah. So what's the significance of that? that I was so quick to go into a story about something that's a mile away that I can't see. Okay. Rather than just the, the reality, just taking the, it for what it was. The reality of that situation is I heard cuck, 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 and then told a story about what it was. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And we go through our entire life doing that, mm. making quick assessments of the present moment. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that's off in the distance. It's relationships. It's why the person in front of you in line cut it's, it's whatever. Yeah. Uh, usually uh, b b coming from our own junk mm -hmm. um, or, or why somebody, uh, you were going way back, like, why do some people against my success? So the story we tell ourselves determines our emotional reaction, our physical, psychological reaction to it. So, you know, how dare you not think Crave is amazing? It's, I've, I'm a little boy wanting affirmation. Mm -hmm. You're a jerk. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's no. The, the story could be, he doesn't speak English well. The story could be he's hard of hearing. The story could be he's already uh, looked at all your stuff and thinks it's awesome and he's kind of embarrassed. Mm -hmm. There's a million stories we could tell, yeah. but we only have two or three that we apply to everything. Yeah. I went to this, uh, speaking to Michael Gervais earlier, he, I went to this uh, conference where he was the keynote speaker. Like a th like thousand people probably in the audience, this big ballroom. And he's telling this story and he's getting everybody fired up. You guys... Sports psychology professionals, you're training the tip of the spear to be the, t well, gets everybody fired up. And he goes, okay, at the end, okay, <laughs> raise your hand if you want to come up here and be tested in front of everybody. And I was like, uh, uh, whatever. And he counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, counted eight hands, something like that. And he goes, what the F is wrong with you people? I just gave that speech and nobody uh, wants to come up. And as he's saying that, I was in the front row as close as you are. And I was like, you know, in my head, I was like, I'm not afraid to come up. It just seems, you know, like I'd be like, oh, me or you or right. Yeah. Like it seems like a hassle. Yeah. Okay. So as that thought is landing in my head, he goes, yeah, it's not really about coming up here. It's about the story you're telling yourself about why you didn't. Mm. And I was like, oh man, it's a hassle. Mm -hmm. I tell myself that about a lot of stuff. Mm. I talk myself out. This is one of my taping points. I talk myself out of things because they're a hassle. Wouldn't have been a hassle. It was eight steps. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a hassle. And you get to interact with some guy you really look up to. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, it's funny that you say that because before his speech, I saw him out in the hall. I'm like, hey, man. He's like, hey, I you know, kind of remember me a little bit from meeting him before. I'm like, hey, it was good to see you. I'm excited to see you talk, whatever. Yeah. Here's an opportunity to go be friends with him. I'm like, <laughs> it's a hassle. Too much effort. And then it's the same mm. distance to my car when we're done. I'm not going, it's a hassle. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, it's a hassle. No, oh, I'm not going home. Yeah. It's a hassle. Yeah. So that's just the story. Oddly enough, self-talk, the little voice in our head, our self-talk develops from the way our primary caregiver really gives us instruction as we're learning to talk. So the voice in our head is gener generally the voice of our primary caregiver. Mm. And then it becomes our own flavored through whatever. And so a couple of weeks after that, I was having lunch with my mom and she goes, you know, I don't go much, much farther than the base and the FM 78 anymore. It's such a hassle. And I was like, oh, <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> So I, I uh, swallowed that rule of hers whole and mm -hmm. I apply it to my own things. Mm. And so I, I, looking back now, having had that re re realization, I see how often I did that. And now I almost always say yes instead. Mm. Even if I say, hey, hey, you want to come to a video for Crave? <clears throat> kind of a hassle. But it's not. But mm -hmm. that's my first thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because uh, my new motto is just show up and see what happens. Mm. To me, that's as mindful as I can be. Yeah. Uh, to try to override my tendency to be stuck in my story about things. Mm -hmm. So does that kind of make sense about the yeah. narrative? Oh yeah, for sure. And all the time in the present moment, we're having, we're fighting that thing. You going, oh, these guys are so much better than me. Mm -hmm. That's a negative assessment. You're looking or left and right. Ugh, I'm no good in comparison to these guys. Mm -hmm. You're there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Check it. Wiggle mm -hmm. your toes. Be there. Yeah, it's cool. Be where your shoes your shoes are or your feet are. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's a really, it's very cool. Yeah, it's really cool figuring out your narratives and then realizing there's only two or three that you just apply to everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to go back to the like the coaching, <laughs> coaching slash teaching, like instructing, helping other people. That's one of the things about the skydiving community that I, I just really, really like. I think it's so neat is that there's a there's a culture of of instruction there's a culture of teaching mm -hmm. and i really like that i think it's a great thing so many people in the skydiving community are excited to share their knowledge with others and i i think for the most of the time it's with the sincere they just we just want to see each other get better mm -hmm. i mean now there's some people who are you know doing it for other reasons but i really what i've seen most of the time skydivers just want to see other skydivers get better and maybe it maybe it's like selfishly because then you have more people to fly with that you can do more cool <laughs> stuff but still sure. it's i mean I, I think that's really awesome about the skydiving world um and so because of that there's a lot of coaching that goes on and that's something that <clears throat> me and my friends and different people and and some of the instructors for crave when we get together and talk and i interview them one of the things I, I like to ask them is what makes a good coach? Because a lot of them, that's actually part of their livelihood. They actually coach um, mm -hmm. for, for money, which is great. I mean, it's, it's an awesome way for them to make a living and share their knowledge. I, I think it's awesome that, that that's a part of the skydiving culture. Um, and so it's always interesting for me to hear from them because they've been doing it for a long time and they've really, most mm -hmm. of them have really thought about it. Like, what does it mean to be a good coach? So. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, so fundamentally, coaching is, is me handing you a packet of information. I know this thing that you don't know, right? Okay. So a huge part of that is my experience. I can't teach you anything about skydiving, but I can teach you about psychology, about performance, right? Yeah. So, so I, I, have, I have this packet and I have to hand it to you. But if, I'm on, if I know everything there is to know, and I'm on my A game, handing off information, but you're only on your C game receiving it, what's the point? So you have to be experienced, you have to know your stuff, but you have to also be able to deliver that information in a way that's palatable to the recipient. So part of that is learning to, um, it's relational. You have to be able to relate to the person. Uh, if you go to a seminar and you pay money, some, some figurehead is cramming information down your throat. That's 
cool. Like you're like, yeah, let, let me take some notes. But if you're one on one teaching people how to jump out of a plane or how to perform soccer better, you have to be able to tell them things in a way that they're going to hear it. Mm. So you have to be able to read body language. You have to be able to understand their their mental models. You have to, be able to understand, see their reactions, and you have to continually tweak. I was just with a, a client the other day. He's a smart guy, really smart guy, but he's not necessarily educated. But he's he's accomplished in life, and he's he's in his probably fifties. Uh, but he he doesn't. I could see, I, I would see him processing things, and I was like, okay, I see him. I see him struggling with this packet of information I'm getting, and he the, something's missing. Like he's getting it, but something's missing. And his his wife is with him, kind of interpreting, and he'd like, oh, okay, okay. And then what I finally figured through time, it just clicked, is that he is almost 100% visual in his thinking. Hmm. He doesn't do well with words. He 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 would hear them, and he'd like. Ugh. I guess he's trying to make a picture of himself. So mm -hmm. when I started talking in metaphors, mm. he lit up. Ah, voila. So that's an indicator of being a good coach. I'm just saying I'm a good coach, but, but being able to go, oh, this is the way this guy's going to get this information. Yeah. Because sometimes I might feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. Somebody's not getting it. Mm -hmm. But that's always a me thing. That's mm. always a me problem. Mm. I'm not delivering the information right. It's not the problem of the recipient. Mm -hmm. So, so being able to do that efficiently and repeatedly is yeah. the thing. Okay. So, what about with the negative and positive and negative? Because <clears throat> you said we 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 tend to be more negative creatures, mm -hmm. right, as humans. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes, like what I've noticed about myself when I'm trying to coach or help someone with a certain skill, um, and I think this was kind of going back to remember we were talking about soccer when I was coaching the soccer, yeah. sometimes almost being too positive. And I've actually had student, like people that I'm coaching, one person tell me that like, you're too nice, man. You're, you're like, I don't feel like you're helping me because you're not giving me. You're not chewing my ass? Well, they, they didn't want me to yell and scream at them, but they wanted me to give them some real feed. Whereas I thought I was giving real feedback. I thought I was, but I was trying to do it in a positive, encouraging way uh -huh. and, and tell them things they need to work on they were just hearing all positivity, but not feeling like they were improving. Okay. Well, so that's not helpful to them, okay. right? Like, yeah. even though I think I'm being helpful because I'm being nice, sure. that's, they weren't coming to me to be nice. They were coming to me. To, so how do you balance that? Like, yeah, I think telling people what they're doing wrong, like, hey, your golf swing, you keep slicing it because you're doing this, like, stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's, that's it, stop. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's that easy. Yeah. Uh, I take cash or check. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you're mistaking, you're, you keep throwing nice into it. I think because maybe people in the context of the situation, people are going, maybe Chris, you're just too nice. And so you're going, oh, part of this problem must be that I'm too nice. And the opposite of that would be stern or, 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 or like matter of fact, whatever. It's not about nice or mean. It's about the delivery of the information. Okay. So maybe you're just not delivering the right information. Mm. You can deliver. Or maybe I'm not delivering it the right way. I think I'm delivering it. Yeah. So, but it's so, not. So like you, yeah, you're, you're not delivering it in a way that they're taking it. Mm -hmm. And you, but, but so I think part of the problem is your belief that maybe being nice is part of the problem. I don't think that's part of the problem. Mm. It's something in the information that they're not absorbing it. Okay. Whether it's the information or the delivery, they're not. Yeah. And so there's a lot, like just using the golf thing as an example, there's a lot of ways to approach that. So if you and I were playing golf and uh, you're, you sli you're slicing it I w uh, and you're like, man, what's wrong? You know, like you throw your club, whatever. Uh, I go, would you, you want me to t tell you what I think? And then you go, sure. Okay. Well, Whatever. Okay. Yeah. I think we should be out here having fun. You know, like, but if you go, <laughs> yeah, where am I going wrong? Oh, club face isn't coming through square. Right. So, so I've, I've asked for permission to give you information. So that's not really the question you're asking, but it's like, what, this is going back to mindfulness. What does the moment call for? Mm -hmm. And so, so maybe if somebody goes, Hey, you're not giving me what I want. Well, what do you want? I want instruction about how to kick a soccer ball. Okay. And then you just keep giving them information until it clicks. And then you go, oh, this person takes the information this way. Mm. Because everybody takes information differently. Mm. Um, 
if you and I are having a conversation, you're like, I generally trust that you have some wisdom. That's why we're here, right? Mm -hmm. If I tell my wife the same stuff, she's like, oh, here we go, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I can't give her the same this information in the same way as I right. would give you. Yeah. So you, so you have to learn that. Is that help? Or, or let's dig deeper if not. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that, yes, it does help to a certain degree. I mean, some of it's just going to be me processing and then trying things with other people that I'm yeah. working with or whatever. And sometimes it's just friends or whatever. But it, it boils down to what does the person want? You yeah, have to figure I, I think, that out. I think that actually might be the, the thing that kind of clicked in my mind when you said that. Like, I never took the... When they gave me that feedback, and they did it in a very kind... I mean, it was, they were trying to be helpful. It wasn't like they were griping or complaining or they were just telling me. Um, I never took the time to be like, oh, well, what do you want? I never asked that. Sure. And that's, that's a problem. I was like, oh, shoot, I never asked for that. Yeah. So, like, that's not helpful. Here's the thing like, uh, <clears throat> we uh, go, this goes back to mental models. We have mental models of everything. We aren't really in reality and we aren't really present. So, you may be watching some, um, say, your soccer team play, and your biases, your beliefs, your your vision of what that problem is with that player is whatever it is. And you go, okay, I'm coaching this guy. Mm -hmm. Let me tell him what the problem is. Mm. And he's like, you're not, you're not helping me. You didn't go, what do you think the problem is? Mm -hmm. He might come or she might come around to what you're seeing, mm -hmm. but they have their own, they have their own context. Mm. We assume people have the same mental context we do. So they might have a problem. They might have a rock in their shoe. You're like, well, if you'd quit limping when you run, you know, yeah. <laughs> so run without limping. And then they're like, ouch, ouch, ouch. Yeah. But hey, what's going on? Well, there's a rock in my shoe. Oh, well, take the rock. Out. So they have a context. You have a context. You have to understand their context mm. because even though the thing you're teaching may be factually accurate, right, correct, mm -hmm. it may not be what they're looking for. Mm. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you're just missing. You're giving them good information. I could go, I could, you know, go to a, um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, some people came in to work with their aspiring young baseball star because uh, he didn't hustle. So they wanted me to teach him to be you know, on it and hustle. Mm -hmm. About five minutes with that kid to trying to determine what he thought was going on. Well, if I make a mistake, my dad chews my ass in the car on the way home. So he wasn't not hustling. He was avoiding making mistakes so he didn't get his ass chewed. When we're told what to do, there's a natural resistance to it unless we're asking. Mm -hmm. And so if you're telling them to do something that isn't really the problem, they're going to kind of have resistance anyway. Oh, mm -hmm. you're missing the mark a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you have to get into their context and then lead them to the thing. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. This is really a thing with kids too. Like mm -hmm. kids and, kids and uh, parents, you know, you, you, it's, as your kids become, um, as kids become middle school, high school age, and they start to individuate, they want to become an individual away from their, their parents, the best bet is to go, hey, what do you think about this? Lead them to where you want them versus go, hey, do this thing. Yeah. Uh, you don't know anything. Uh, yeah, and some, some people I think need that or want that more than others. The, the freedom or the direction? The freedom. Yeah, yeah. Because cause especially teenagers, they don't, uh, they want to be individuals, but they don't have the skills. Mm -hmm. So... They, there's a, they buck against direct direction mm -hmm. and they want this freedom, but they don't really have it. Yeah. But I mean, I, like I have four, four kids and I can, I mean, they're, they're so different. Mm -hmm. They're so different. And, and you know, one of them, I can maybe say, Hey, look, this is the problem. This is what I see. This is what you need to do. Stop doing this, whatever. Like I can just tell them and I'm like, thank you. All right, yeah. cool. I'm going to try better or whatever. And another one, I can do that. And they'd be like, don't talk to me about that. Like in a sense, they don't <laughs> yeah. say those words, yeah. but it's like, yeah. they, they don't, that doesn't work. It's not. There's an interesting sort of thing in that that goes to coaching with the, like the old school coaching, hard ass, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I, I encounter this a lot with dads mm -hmm. when I work. I was coached in a way that you know, if you were thirsty, they told you to suck on a rock and you know, we didn't have water <laughs> breaks. Like everything now is manby pamby, right? Yeah. And, um, there's a, that's, I guess that has its place, but it's not like um, that the world is kumbaya now. It's that there's a better way to help human beings perform, mm -hmm. which is through knowing what they want, not telling them what they want. Mm -hmm. And so that um, 
the direction and the the aggressiveness of coaching and stuff like that is is uh it creates resistance mm. to whatever the lesson is the old school way of coaching and instruction creates resistance P parenting the same way so but then so then, then i encounter these people who go well that's how i learned that's the best way to learn it's absolutely not scientifically and it goes back to what i was saying about getting into somebody's context if you get into their context you understand their needs why are their needs important i'm the coach i'm well because you're trying to teach them to be better and if you are finger wagging that natural resistance comes you again you're on your a game they're only receiving at a d level because they're intimidated scared mad they hate you you're not getting the most information but if you go hey what do you need in this situation mm -hmm. and lead them to what you know they need as well now they're receptive mm -hmm. and now you can you're a game teacher or coach you're giving them a game information that they're absorbing yeah at that level and the progress is so much greater yeah I, I used to have a kid that i worked with on the sports psychology side who was a volleyball player and she was getting to be deemed as uncoachable in the system and she she was a, a very young playing varsity and uh doing well and then uh started kind of going downhill in varsity and club so her, her parents paid me to come help her out so i went to watch a private lesson of hers and the the coach who's kind of a he's a good coach but he's he's a little little uh gruff but he's a, a semi okay doing he's a good coach um he's like telling her something right he's like why do you keep doing the same mistake that's why she was uncoachable because she wouldn't fix the mistake right mm -hmm. and she goes yeah 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 i get it yeah 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 okay and she was backing away from him and i was watching this from above like mm -hmm. interesting and uh, so the parents come in with her and, and we meet and i go yeah it's an interesting thing i noticed that when she was getting instruction she would go yeah 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 and back away she does that at home too oh my gosh well, what's happening is she, her parents are super critical and kind of hard asses and they're always finger wagging at her. And so her survival instinct is to back away, affirm and get out of that situation. It's mm. fight or flight. And she's mm -hmm. choosing flight. So that, that way of, being of not being instructed mm -hmm. transferred to volleyball because it was the same scenario. She's trying to get away from danger. Yeah. So it wasn't that she was uncoachable. It was that she was not getting the instruction because she was panicking. Mm. So that's the the real um byproduct of that sort of uh, approach to coaching versus hey what what's going on yeah okay and then you use your expertise to fill in the gaps yeah okay so then how does that fit in with like this you know you're talking about what you want versus what you need yeah or i don't know if you said that or if i just thought it but uh, yeah that's what i said yeah so jordan peterson i saw that he was talking in this video and he said when he was like in his i think he said in his 20s or something he decided to kind of get his life together and there's a bunch of he was undisciplined and all this stuff and one of the things he started doing was exercising and so he said he first started going like to, to the gym and actually lifting weights and when he first started lifting weights he could barely bench press i think he said like 75 pounds and even at 75 pounds lots of times other guys in the gym would have to come spot him mm -hmm. and he said he said that was the last thing i wanted was help lifting 75 pounds but it was exactly what i needed yeah so that, as I hear you talking about, you know, getting into their context, giving them what they want, mm -hmm. I can imagine people, the pushback to that is like, yeah, but they're kids or they're whatever. They don't know what they, mm -hmm. just because they want it doesn't mean that, you know, whatever. I can imagine all these things. Yeah. Um, but I understand what you're saying. I see the, I see the value of, of meeting a person in there, whether it's a child or an adult, it doesn't matter. I see that value. But at the same time, I guess I'm more thinking about with kids or people younger well, than me. If I know yeah. what they need, how, how do you, how do, you that, do that? that? That's a, a great, that's what I was trying to get at. And it's a great line of demarcation about it. That attitude of their kids, they don't know. I'm the parent, I'm the coach. I, you know, I should tell them, right. But the best delivery of that okay. is to get into their context and find out what they want. And instead of telling them, what they need you lead them to what they need i gotcha okay and so it becomes real like sort of mamby pamby like well I, my kid like i the way that i was raised i got the belt or whatever yeah like, uh, that doesn't mean it worked yeah. it's, you're just yeah. telling me a story about how you were punished that doesn't mean you learned anything from it right so so you you ask a kid like in a parenting context what do you need i need to have a pet unicorn okay well that's not possible but you're leading them to the thing you would prefer to tell them mm-hmm 
Because when you tell them, especially as they get older, there is resistance. Mm -hmm. When you go, hey, what do you think about this? One, you then lead them to, because they'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Two, they will tell you things in the context of conversation in an open relationship that you would have never figured out on your own. Mm. And so it's like the hustle thing. You might be barking up the wrong tree if you don't ask. Mm. Yeah. That happens a lot. We bark up the wrong tree because we have these mental models of things. Mm -hmm. And so we're just reacting to our mental model. Kids should be this and parents should be that. And you're not going, hey, kid, what's really the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I want to I want to read you a quote and just get your, okay. get your reaction. If you're not first, you're last. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> no, it's um, uh, fueled by, what was it? <laughs> uh, fueled by passion. Dr driven by purpose, fueled by passion. Driven by purpose, fueled by, yeah. yeah. No, that's not it. Um, Wisdom. No, here's, here's a quote. Enjoy what you have while you are in pursuit of what you want. That's process and outcome, isn't it? And, and mindfulness, I think. Yeah. Enjoy what you have while you're in pursuit of what you want. Yeah. But that's, that just goes back to what I say. You, that outcome, whatever it is, if it's what you want for lunch, where you want to live, whatever it is, set it and forget it. But have a plan in place, a, a, a performance plan in place. Those lily pads, you conquer where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, Sean Acor has a book. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but he talks about the Zorro Circle. Like Zorro's trainer came in and goes, if you want to conquer the world, conquer like the Zorro, trainer. the yeah. sword yeah. fighter Zorro. Yeah, I think I think the gist of it, he's he was uh, an alcoholic and he wanted to avenge the death of his family or something. He's going around trying to kill everybody. He goes, you want to go around killing everybody, you got to master the three feet around you. So be the master of that before you get out into the world. So that's the lily pad theory that I have. It's like you master where you're at, you enjoy it, you're present. You're honing the skills, and then you just get to the next one. Repeat, 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 and then the outcome takes care of itself. So you know what it is. You just don't dwell in it. Mm -hmm. You dwell in what you're doing today. What, what, what does this moment call for? And you do what that moment calls for. And sometimes that's chill out. Well, I, I like that. Master the three feet around you. That's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. It is. Because we're, we're, I'm real guilty of this. I'm like, <laughs> one day, I'm going to be, you know, Michael Gervais. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I'm, I, today I'm having an interview with you. I, uh, I kind of have an easy day. I'm going to help this kid that I've really been helping. I, uh, working with some pro volleyball players who are playing in Brazil tomorrow. I'm communicating with them. I'm like, I'm kind of already living what I want. Mm -hmm. I wanted freedom. I wanted variety. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to come hang out. If I, I'm already there. Yeah. But I'm like, well, Michael Gervais is a keynote speaker with this thing that I'm telling the story about. So, yeah, right now he's probably having a coffee, you know, <laughs> at the Starbucks by his house. Yeah. So yeah, it's about it's about that. But we just we're so focused on this this thing we want, this ideal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we oftentimes when we get there, it's like eh, mm. you know, because we habituate real quickly. Mm. Eh. Now I want the next thing. Mm -hmm. And we never learn to enjoy where we're at. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, was in California this last weekend. And uh, just, just witnessed some things where I'm like, wow, these people that, that, I, that I know that are, in, that are kind of around me right now aren't appreciative that they're in Hermosa Beach, California. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm. Uh, I was like, man, this is amazing. Yeah. Whether it's, it's like it's going to go from 62 it's going to soar into the mid 60s and then plummet back to 62 degrees tonight. Like, how could you be concerned about much? You know, right. if you're there, your toes in the sand. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people are missing that. There's a story of this guy, <clears throat> American tourist goes down to Mexico and he's kind of like deep in the heart of Mexico, walking around, going from village to village, just enjoying, you know, this peaceful, slow, peaceful life. And he goes, he walks down this one dirt road and he sees this, um, this farmer guy and the farmer, old, older man, not, not old, but a little like midlife. He's sitting against, leaning up against this tree in the shade and he's drinking a glass of iced tea. And, um, this American tourist, he, he speaks a little bit of Spanish. So he starts talking to the guy and he finds out he's a farmer. He's got this little plot of land right there. Um, and so they start talking and the guy, the American, he's like, so how do you farm, you know, because he, he doesn't see it. And he goes, oh, I just have this little donkey and um, a little bitty, like, it's just a one 
row plow or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's like super simple, super easy. And the American guy, he starts talking, he's thinking, he goes, he goes, well, you know what? If I, um, if I showed you how to, how to do that, um, if I got, if you had a two row thing and two donkeys, you could, you could actually do more, you could do double. And then um, I could help you. I could teach you how to save your money. Like you need to put some of the money to the side and reinvest in your farm. So then eventually you can buy a team of horses and a big plow. And then and he, he goes through this whole process where he, eventually he's got the guy like owning tractors and all this land. And, all, and he, he walks him through this whole thing, like how he can get to this big, huge process, you know, like this big. And he goes, and then once you're there, you can just sit around relax, drink some iced tea, <laughs> and just enjoy life. And this, you know, old Mexican, not old, but this Mexican farmer, he's sitting there in the shade, leaning against a tree. He raises up his glass of iced tea and says, that sounds pretty good. And he, I mean, yeah. exactly. He yeah. was already doing it. Yeah. He was already enjoying his life. Yeah. And we, we just overcomplicate. We, we want so much, we want more, more, more. Yeah. And I, I get it because I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm guilty too. I mean, I want to do it too, you know. And sometimes it's motivated by good things. Like I want to be able to provide for my family. I want to take care of my kids. I want to be able to pay for their college or I want to have enough money that I can fix my roof when there's hail damage. Or, you know, there's good reasons but yeah. it gets out of hand real quick. Sure, but there's, there's always a mindfulness, a lesson in all of that, which is like, eh, I want to be able to fix a hole in my roof. Mm -hmm. The same roof that you pay zero appreciation to, zero days of the week, mm. until it's leaking. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is. Wow, I'm glad I have a roof. Yeah. Right. Gratitude. So, yeah, it's gra gratitude practice is a whole other thing. Of mm. like, I always ask people this. Hey, tell me what you're grateful for, and they'll go, my family, my dog, my house. So it's I call it the Thanksgiving prayer list. Oh, what are you grateful for? My house, my family, my dog, uh, and the hands that prepared these food, this food, <laughs> amen, right? But they're not, gra they're not grateful for everything all the time. Mm -hmm. For me, a big mindfulness, be me present thing is my first sip of coffee from a place. Well, coffee in general, but you know, like if you go to Starbucks, it's like, oh, it's like lava. Yeah. You can't even yeah. get a drink. You're like, oh, dang it. You're just getting vapor, yeah. right? And then finally, oh, I'm grateful for that moment. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And I try to be in that moment. No, we're good. I try to be in that moment and try to, every, every little thing that I get, this is cool. I try to really bask in that and be present in it. Mm -hmm. I'm not great at it, but mm -hmm. it's better than going, you know, oh man, my roof's leaking. Well, you didn't care about me 364 other days. You yeah. know, you weren't grateful for me then. Um, I, I tell this story all the time. This is funny. It, it's because it, it happened here years ago went on a walk right down the hill behind your house and we found uh, fossilized shells. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah. It's cool. Then there's another story about that where this, I'm grateful for the story, not the experience. Took those shells with us to a dinner with some friends. I don't know why. And the, this baby uh, of the friends was playing with it, slobbering on it, whatever. And uh, handed it to me, you know, and I took it, ah, slobbery shell, great. And the mom goes, yeah, she's been real sick with the stomach bug. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like that is awesome. you know, like, great. And then uh, the next day we fly to Disney World. Oh, no. And uh, I, w I wake up in the morning to the sound of my wife throwing up in the hotel. Oh, dude. And I was like, oh, that sucks for her. Let's go. Right. <laughs> Sorry. And then about 10 minutes. No, it wasn't even 10 minutes later. We get, we get on the little bus. Yeah. She's motoring through. We get on the little bus and I'm like, God, oh, this bus is hot. Oh, no. <laughs> this is gross in here. Could smell like the gas fumes or whatever. Uh, pull up to the front of Disney world and we're waiting and they're checking through bags and stuff. And I'm like, I might be, uh, might be coming down with it. And like that I was throwing up oh, man. and, uh, I've been over, this is, this is the greatness of Disney world. I've been over a rail, threw up into a bush. Within a second of that, they call it a protein spill there, of that hitting the ground, the bushes gave way, they parted, and somebody <laughs> escorted me back to the bus. <laughs> like, like, they probably saw me coming off the bus looking a little pale. Like so, we got a live one. Yeah, protein spill. Literally, I'm like half conscious on the bus back to the hotel. <laughs> like, how did I get here? Yeah, I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> so I slept the rest of that day off, and then we, we went, we rallied, and we got better. But the, the, I, I, 
I appreciate that story. I appreciate the laughter we have. I appreciate the, the full circle that that happened right down that hill behind you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just kind of cool. It's just, just about being there. Yeah. I think that's one of the, one of the things about skydiving, because I've heard a lot of skydivers say this, and, and it's one of the things that I've said myself many, many times, is that <clears throat> when we jump, and I've told you this before, but most skydivers, 99% of skydivers, when we jump, it's not about adrenaline. There's, by the time you get your license and you're, you're jumping, when we jump, there's not adrenaline. It's not an adrenaline rush. And I think if you ask a thousand skydivers, I think all of them would say that's not why they jump. They don't jump because they're adrenaline junkies or whatever. Um, when you first are skydiving, yeah. But um, one of the things that I love about skydiving, and I've heard other people say as well, it forces you to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like when you, when I let go of the plane, even before I let go of the plane, I'm, as I'm climbing out, like I'm just so focused in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I've I've been so focused in that moment many times that I've forgotten, you know, I jump with a a GoPro, I'll forget to turn that thing on (laughs) because I'm I'm just so focused on on what we're doing, on that that moment, on that jump, on being with my friends, feeling, you know, when we open the door and the wind Mm -hmm. and the smell of the, the, the exhaust of the plane and everybody, oh, it's just, yeah. And you, you, I let go of the plane, and that is all that exists, mm-hmm. is that 45 to 60 seconds of free fall. And I, I've told people before, I get a similar feeling when I fly in the wind tunnel, but if I'm stressed out about something, or I'm anxious, or I'm worried, or I've had a fight with my wife, or something's going on with my kids, or whatever, when I let go of the plane, all of that stuff disappears. That stuff is gone for that short amount of time. and. And I've heard a lot of people say that, and, and that's, I, I, I just love it. It's so, so good. Yeah, I'll often joke with people, like uh, if I could follow them around, as I'm trying to teach them to become present, right? mm-hmm. if I could follow them around and like a little light bulb went off above their head every time they started to time travel, Yeah. that I just have a switch. <laughs> <laughs> back and they're like, <laughs> instantly back to the present. Right? Nice, yeah. That's the, it's, the, uh, it's the far end of the spectrum of wiggling the toes. Mm-hmm. Well, even farther than that is jumping out of a plane. Because even though you say there's no adrenaline anymore, you said the right word. There's a forcing function that every system in your survival brain says, be acutely aware of this moment. Mm -hmm. Because you're simulating death. Mm. Because if you went to the edge of the Grand Canyon and jumped, you're dying. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, Mm -hmm. your primitive brain isn't going, hey, this is mostly safe and whatever. You're acutely aware. And so, Again, that's an extreme, but that level of presence can be conditioned into us. You're forced to have it. You have no other way. You couldn't jump out of there and try to be anxious about bills or whatever. Mm-hmm. You just your brain wouldn't let you. Yeah. You, the reason is because you've kind of you, you've taken your prefrontal cortex offline, and you're in your primitive brain, just going mm-hmm. yes. It's, mm-hmm. it's 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 the dopamine. It's the adrenaline. It's that. Um, it's your amygdala going. Yeah, let's go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there, there's a way to condition ourselves to try to at least be that present most of the time. It's not quite quite the same chemical rush, obviously, yeah, yeah. but that level of attention to the present is possible through conditioning. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing with that is you jump out of the plane, that attention in the present is forced, much like we are forced to time travel by our monkey brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to condition and train yourself to to put your attention in the present if there isn't some forcing function. Mm. Yeah. So, so you have to rec- mostly recognize you're not present and then have those skills to bring yourself to the present. Do, do you, have, do you like actually have techniques or things that you tell like when you're working with people? Like, you, that checking in on the, the physical like stuff. Like with the toes and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, because you can't, here's the problem with the monkey brain though. You get good at going, oh, I'm time traveling. Let me bring it back to the, bring it back to the present. Uh, the temperature is this. I taste this. I hear this. I see this. Okay, I'm present. It's mm. like a, it's like a helium balloon. It just starts floating off. You got to reel it back in. Yeah. So you may have to check in on your senses a hundred times today, but you only have to do it 98 tomorrow, 95, 94, and then you find out you're present. Even if you're present 50 percent of the time, your mm. life's more enjoyable. Yeah. And again, it's all it, mindfulness isn't just being present. It's present without the negative assessment of the current experience. I'm in traffic and this sucks. It's stupid. 
I hate Austin, <laughs> right? Or this is me, 1604 is becoming Austin. Austin's becoming LA with the traffic. Or I could go, wow, I like this Joe Rogan. Hey, Jordan Peterson's on Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. There's a conscious choice in that moment to not assess it as bad, accept it as it is, and do what the moment calls for. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that accepting it as is without assessment is a pretty, pretty crucial part to all of it. It, it seems like that, that kind of thing can be also connected with, because this is one of the things I wanted to ask you about talking about, was like performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, there are quite a few people in skydiving that actually compete. There's all sorts of different things that they compete in. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit was performance anxiety and, and performing at a very high level. Uh -huh. um, and then, I don't know if it's the other side of the coin, but just kind of connected to that, like I find myself, as I get older, not resisting, but not wanting to compete at certain things that I, activities that I find really enjoyable, I don't want to compete at them because it's almost like sometimes the competition steals the joy from me. Uh -huh. Like I love to fish, uh -huh. but I have no, zero desire to ever go to a fishing tournament. Uh -huh. Like to me, that seems, oh, that would, it seems like it would just ruin fishing for me. Yeah. Um, and skydiving even, I, I, obviously I love to skydive, but right now, where I'm at right now, I have, I have zero desire to compete. And I, I don't have anything against compete. I think competition is great, awesome. I mean, there's, I'm not against it. I'm just saying for me, it, it's almost like it would, I would be then so focused on winning mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be able to enjoy. Yeah, it goes back to what we've been talking about the whole time. You, you, competition, at least in your head, puts you into a focus on the outcome. Yeah. Your sure. your ranking in the, the the competition versus the joy of the process. Yeah. For some people, some people can compartmentalize that. Sometimes it's for fun. Sometimes it's for competition. Some people um, get the the. Um, some people it's all together. Mm. Like I still enjoy the process, although I want this particular outcome. But the the pro that's any anybody that competes right like sports psychology wise like you don't compete to lose you, yeah. compete, you compete to win <laughs> exactly but the way to win most often is to be engaged in the process in the moment so your preference is to not compete because you tend to get caught up in outcomes right so which is cool that's great yeah no problem with that at all if you did want to start competing you would just have to be conscious of staying in the process, which is why I do it. And then the outcome is, you know, whatever it is. Secondary. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'd be like if, uh, you know, you're a cook at IHOP and you're, you, you know, you're like, I don't want to cook another pancake, but you might want to come home and cook something nice. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're just conscious of uh, what you're doing in the present. Yeah. You don't have to turn. It's what I was saying about my mindful walks. I start to go, well, I did four yesterday. I should do five today. I, during COVID, it was getting to where I was doing like 13 mile walks. I would, I would add like five miles, six miles, eight miles, 10 miles, 13. That would be my week. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. My feet were all messed up. My toes still <laughs> hurts from it. It's stupid, but I, I tend to get real outcome focused. Yeah. And then I go, well, I only did six miles. I'm, I'm junk. I'm garbage. Yeah. Right. So, so I literally two days ago, walking at the park, I started going, well, I should probably walk a little farther. No, I just listen to my feet. Quick, mm. quick, quick, quick. Then I heard the, kah, 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 kah. then, oh, I'm in that moment. And, and being present in that moment gave me a story to tell you. Yeah. You know, instead yeah. of me being caught up in the outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about, and I think it's kind of connected to what you are just saying, is uh, like performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. So for people who do enjoy, enjoy competing and want to compete and want to be in skydiving, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, I mean, is it, that's a, a real thing, right? Performance anxiety. Sure. And it is a... Uh, a byproduct of an outcome focus, time traveling to the future, because you're anxious about failure. Mm -hmm. You're not anxious about winning. Yeah. Right. So right. you time travel to the future and uh, uh, play out all of your failures, all potential fail failures, potential worst case scenarios, and you bring that anxiety back to the present. Mm. There's a natural part, there's a natural anxiety about performance, there's a natural anxiety about jumping out of a plane, whether you feel it or not. There's a physical, emotional, chemical reaction happening. Uh, 
that's really just performing your, uh, preparing your body to perform. So if you could tell a different story about anxiety, which is, oh, I'm nauseous. That's just blood leaving your digestive system to go where it's more, more needed. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot to it, but you're really just anxious because you're afraid of failing. So you can learn to manage that, learn to accept it as it is. Okay, I'm a little bit anxious about failing. But then you can also learn those process things, those lily pads across the pond, those become your focus. And then within each process goal is a performance goal. Today I'm going to do 10 perfect reps. Today I'm going to eat this. Today I'm going to go get a massage to you know loosen up, whatever. And you just keep your attention on those things. And that uh, distraction is a bad word. I'm not a fan of distracting to avoid anxiety, but you are choosing your focus versus letting your mind travel to your potential failures. Mm. But then, then there's no there's no absence of anxiety ever. Mm -hmm. It's a natural part of our brain, but the story we tell about it can be changed. Mm. That's really good. That that that's really good. Um, one of my like life mentor kind of big brother in a sense. I can remember when I was in college, we were having a conversation. He's older than me, um, and we were talking about anxiety. And he was he was saying, you know. He was encouraging me not to be too quick to dispense with anxiety. Like what happens sometimes, he was saying, you know, you, there's something going on, a situation or a perceived threat or, or you think something's going to happen so you feel anxious mm -hmm. and worried and concerned. And so you, you make a decision or you do something quickly because you want to get rid of that anxiety and then it ends up making it way worse. Yeah. Or it just... Pro, it, it just all it does is delay that problem yeah. and or whatever and he was saying you know you need to because I guess he was kind of seeing me do that from time to time mm -hmm. he's like dude you got to just relax for a second just sit with the anxiety just almost like deal with it yeah calm yourself down calm your mind so you can make better decisions because maybe the best way to deal with that is just to wait yeah maybe not always I mean sometimes yeah. waiting can make it worse sure. but, but I mean he was he was saying, don't be so quick mm -hmm. to avoid that anxious situation. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of components to that. One is we have this natural reaction, this natural anxious reaction to these perceived threats. Sometimes that's real. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a construct of our mental models because our mom was anxious and this was anxious. Yeah. And you know, yeah. the family history you have a lot of anxious people. Um, so, so taking that beat to go, okay, I'm having a reaction. I'm, I'm noticing anxiety. I'm being mindful. I'm not going, this is awful. I'm going, hey, I'm, I'm having some physical, uh, psychological sensations. Is this me going down the path I've been conditioned to do? Or is this like based on a real threat? Mm -hmm. And even taking that beat gives you enough sort of solid footwork to figure out what to do next. Mm. And in the, in the mindfulness uh, of lens, there's being and doing. And what you're saying is you're famous. Like sometimes you just be. Except sit in it mm -hmm. versus do something. Yeah. This is awful. I got to do something. Yeah, yeah. And so just taking that beat is often enough. But sometimes you just have to sit in it and be. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole other thing, which is anxiety comes from, or anxiety manifests in our thinker, in our in our <laughs> in our mind, right? It sounds like a, something you say to a three-year-old. It is. It's. I am. <laughs> I got to really dumb it down for you. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I'm still not getting all of it, but that's all right. Okay, it's okay. You can watch this back. Yeah. Um, so we are, like, I'm not even going to start this. Okay, wait. Let's go back because I don't know what you said. So what happens in our thinker? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to get you, but I first I have to describe the thinker. Okay, all right. If you tried to figure out who you are, you can't. You, there's your self. What am I a dad? Am I a son? Am I a father? Am I with that dad and father? Are sometimes the same thing. <laughs> am I a husband? What there's just no what you really are is a presence, a spirit, a being, okay, which occupies the sack of meat and bones, yeah. Part of which is a brain which thinks it is a mind, but it is not a um historically accurate thing, yeah, and it's it not is, always rational, it is not. Pulling or from the wisdom of the, the ages. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? It's prone to <laughs> real dumb stuff, right? Uh, as, as my wife can attest to. Sure. Um, so the, we tend to think that the thinker is us. Mm -hmm. It's not. 
It's bursts of electricity in our brain we apply a meaning to. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you're processing that. What, do, how does well, that Well, because, because I'm thinking about um, a really insightful thing. So my oldest son, he, he's, he's a really, I mean, you know him. He's, he's a really deep thinker. I love talking with him because we have great conversations. He forces me to really question a lot of stuff in a good way. He's, he's a lot of fun. Anyway, um, he was talking about, and I think it was something he had heard on a podcast or something, but it got him thinking about how much of me like my, my thoughts and my perspective and my viewpoint and even the way I believe about certain arguments that I'll make, uh -huh. apologetics that I use for certain ideas or things like, that's not me. And most of those thoughts, I didn't even come up with those. Yeah. Almost all that stuff in my thinker <laughs> yeah. came from outside. Like the stuff that we're talking about right here, I've, most of what I've been saying and what I believe is me quoting other people. Mm -hmm or sharing ideas that I got from a book or from a video or from a conversation. Yeah. So I don't know that that's what you were saying, but that's what it made me think well, of. That, that's, so when you ask what I was processing, that's what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, analysis of the thinker. It's because we think that it's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not, it's, a, it's a, an amalgam of everything you've ever heard, listened to, and what you choose to rigidly believe, mm -hmm. even if it's wrong, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very biased filter of which we, how we experience the world. I don't remember what the original point was about the thinker at this point, um, other than it's the thinker that, de okay, this is what it was. So in the anxiety thing, or any, any distress we're in, it's the thinker that's causing the distress. It's the story we're telling about the thing, not the thing itself, mm -hmm. remember the Stoic philosophy. And so you can step outside of the thinker. It's called metacognition, thinking about thinking. You can, <laughs> for me, it's, it, it, skydiving works. It's getting on top of it and looking at it and going, wow, my thinker is super negative right now. Not I'm super negative, not this is awful, the world sucks. It's like, wow, my thinker is really going downhill. Mm. Now you're not experiencing the thinker through your own eyeballs in the first person. You're seeing it like a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. And you're now free from at least a large portion of the physiological, emotional, and psychological ramifications of your admittedly faulty beliefs about things. Yeah. And so that fits back into the anxiety piece. Am I anxious because I'm a human who's going to perform and potentially be embarrassed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, well, that's okay. I'll just sit and be in that. Mm -hmm. Or is this my thinker going crazy because, you know, my grandpa couldn't go across a bridge in an RV. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so who knows? An uh, even deeper thing about the thinker, this comes from, uh, I, think I, wanna go, I think I got it from Eckhart Tolle, which I highly recommend The Power of Now as a life-changing book. Um, there's even some genetic component to that of like, like say your grandparents were in the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? And then they survive and... and uh, or maybe great grandparents, and then they pass down that trauma to by their actions, by the way they parent their kids, and that becomes part of their genetic makeup. And the thinker, part of your thinker is five generations, a hundred generations old, because mm. it's there's this genetic material, your eye color, the way you process things are being passed down. Mm -hmm. Um, there, I've heard this like, you may be allergic to sweet potatoes because of something somebody 500 years ago did, mm. right? And so imagine how that also, uh, how you filter the world, mm -hmm. but you're also carrying their baggage. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy to think that like- Yeah, because those dynamics and those stories get passed yeah, along. As, as does the DNA. That made that possible. Yeah, the, well the D, so, so <laughs> you're in this, you know, say the Holocaust or whatever. Urine, you and said then, urine. And then what? You said urine. Urine, you said there's urine in the Holocaust. You, you then affect your kids, right? And then that becomes part of their DNA, their genetic makeup. Like the way that they, because genes are, are not what people think necessarily. There's a genetic predisposition for things, but then your environment turns genes on, mm. not the genetics. Mm -hmm. So these genetic things are getting passed down and they're getting turned on or turned off through mm -hmm. generations. And so you may filter something a certain way because of something that happened in Scotland you know, mm. hundred years, 500 years ago. So that's not even, that's not real. Yeah. That's a, that's a bias that we just have. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, being able to step outside of the thinker and go, Hey, this thinker is prone to some significant bias. Yeah. Let me just entertain a different thought. 
Yeah. Don't you have to believe it? Just let me entertain it. Yeah. Well, and, and what I was saying, like that, that idea that my thoughts and my perspective, that that's not me. Mm-hmm. It came from outside, uh-huh. um, whether outside means mom and dad or yeah. whatever. Um, the more that I think about that and dwell on that, and even that, that first conversation like I was saying with my son where he kind of brought that to my attention, is like it, that, that recognition, that realization, allows me to hold loosely to those convictions and those things that I think make up me. Yeah. And when, I, when one of those convictions is questioned by something else, I get new evidence or new information yeah. or whatever, and I'm forced to then question what I thought was reality or the way I thought things were or the way I think I am, whatever. It's, it's a little bit easier for me to be like, oh, yeah, I can change that. I can change the way I think about that yeah. because that wasn't me. In, it wasn't me to begin with. So, so to you change have, it, I'm just changing. You're, you're nailing it. You have awareness of the thinker and that it's potentially biased preferential information Mm -hmm. so just that awareness gives you enough latitude when your beliefs are challenged to uh not have an egoic reaction we have what a a reaction oh an egoic reaction okay so you don't go oh no uh i know this to be true so let me fight against it you can go wow i know it's kind of all bullshit anyway (laughs) and so maybe i'm just rigidly grabbing to this yeah Eh, who cares Mm mm-hmm Kind of a thing we a thing we were touching on is like, if you can become aware that the thinker isn't you and it isn't fact, it is not truth. It's what you choose to believe is true, your preference. Then you can really just be flexible enough to not react to things because mm. you can give your you can give other opinions or other beliefs or ideals the benefit of the doubt mm. because you're not rigidly your ego is not attached to your own. Mm-hmm. Which is amazing. Yeah, I call it the ninety ten rule when I help people through this. Like ninety percent of the time that you are put out, spinning out about something, offended by something, it's you're absolutely wrong in the way you're seeing it. Yeah, you're just absolutely wrong. Ten percent of the time, uh, you may be right, but it doesn't even matter. Yeah. <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> Yeah. So basically, 100% of the time, we're spinning out, and who cares? Mm-hmm. Because we're spinning out about stuff we're not present, whatever. And there are bad things that happen in life, or there are stressful situations, but most of the time, it's a construct of our own, you know, absurd, rigid, you know, grip of our beliefs. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so back to, like, performance and, and sports and activities or whatever. Um, and I was telling you that I was helping coach the soccer team at my kid, my boy's school. And one of the things I would try to tell, I remember a couple different times, both the junior high and the high school, before we would start a game, like kind of going into the game, I would, I would try to tell them, I'd be like, look, I want you guys to be confident, not cocky. Mm-hmm. Like there's a, there's a big difference between being cocky and arrogant and thinking you're awesome and just being confident in your ability and who you are mm-hmm. and trying to help them see that and, and go in with a, with a confident mindset. Mm-hmm. That is, I'm not saying that if you're confident, you're automatically going to win. That, mm-hmm. Obviously, that, that's not the case. But that, that mindset, I, I think that's very helpful. I okay. agree. So, so how, do you, how, um, do you, how do you do that? There's, there's, a, there's a flaw in that thing in this context. Maybe, potentially. What you just said is a is a cliche ish sort of saying yeah be don't be cocky be confident okay yeah. well how do i be confident coach okay right so yeah you, no you, that's you, great you probably can't answer that uh, because people yeah. don't think about it no i'd have to think for yeah. quite a while <laughs> the way to be confident is to feel that you are competent and to feel that you are competent you have to develop skills Mm-hmm. So you actually have to have the skills to back up confidence. So confidence comes from feeling competent, which you can actually have the skills and still not feel competent. Mm-hmm. So there's a psychological component too. Right. So the flaw in your statement, it's 100% accurate, but you're pre-assuming that those kids have the skills or they're confident in their skills mm. or that they can express their skills. Mm-hmm. And in a middle school, especially in high school too, 
um, there are so many um, potential imagined anxiety threats, uh, social standing, you know, all that stuff, getting yelled at in the car on the way mm -hmm. home, that it's not easy to go, okay, coach, I got it. I'll be confident, whatever that means. Yeah. So confidence has to be developed mm. through coaching. Yeah. Through that's, that's, really, that's really helpful. Yeah. And then that goes back to like breaking things down into those little pieces that mm -hmm. you can actually perform or not and yeah. evaluate and, and then critically yeah. look at it and say, oh, okay, you're not, yeah, when it, you trap the ball, you're not receiving the ball. You're just holding your foot out like a club or whatever. So, you know, makes, yeah, and so then to develop those skills, whatever the skills are, back to the chunking and the, the parts of skills, you have to develop all of them, get competent in all of them. That still doesn't mean you believe that you're competent in mm -hmm. So that's a whole other dynamic. Mm -hmm. So it's this, this process. Mm -hmm. So a better thing, I've never even thought this before, but a better thing to say is don't be cocky, stick to the process. Mm -hmm. Don't be cocky, be where your feet are. Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, don't, don't be anything, just be present. Yeah. Just, just kick whatever. So that's a thought. That's a, that's a, I'm going to chew on that on my drive home. But I was talking to some pro volleyball players a couple days ago who they're the ones I mentioned they're playing in Brazil tomorrow. And I was talking about one of the fundamentals of sports psychology is having a routine. It's what you eat for breakfast all the way up to game time. And then each part of a game, there's a routine because what you want is a, a set repeatable series of thoughts and we're we good. Yep repeatable behaviors that funnel you to the action, to the task at hand. If you're gonna go skydiving, well, you gotta drive to the place, put on your suit, safety checks, right? There's these things. Yeah. And your focus on those things leads you to the moment of performance. Right. So that should derail you from distraction, right? So uh, I was working on with these players and uh, both of them were college players, they're now professionals, uh, talking about routine and this this one of them says well i have a routine and serve receive that is this thing but it only works half the time the goal the it's the process it is to do the routine it is to have the things it is not about the outcome of the thing you can't say that it only works half the time right is that what you're getting yeah about? well you're you're saying my the goal is to have a, a routine, routine every like, time <laughs> yeah. not the outcome of the yeah. routine yeah and if the routine is solid then half the time, it, like it's serve receive, half the time you shank the ball. That's a technical problem. You need to work on your skills. Yeah. But she, but but people think that the routine be, or or what, the things we're talking about, this building confidence that if I do these things, the outcome is favorable. No, that is not a guarantee. But the outcome will be favorable more often than not mm -hmm. if you build all the steps progressively. Yeah, that's almost exactly what when I was talking about that book, Seven Days in Utopia, that the way you articulated it right there is almost exactly what you're saying, like, just do the process. Yeah. That's, that's the goal is, that the, the outcome is not the goal, the process is the goal, like, just do it. Yeah, like, just do it. If I, hold my, if I hold the volleyball here, and I hit it with my hand like this, and it does that, well, every time I do that, it's gonna do that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. just do the process. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah. And then there's a, there's an element of that, which when you're developing the skills, if the process isn't working or it consistently provides the wrong result, then, then the process needs to be changed mm -hmm. or, or made better. But that's the great thing about this lily pad idea that I have is that you're getting real life feedback in the moment. Mm -hmm. So you go, this didn't work all day. Maybe this is flawed. Maybe drinking six beers when I play golf doesn't help my game. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I'm so relaxed. I, there's something wrong with my swing. Well, maybe it's because you're seeing double. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, back to your original thing, you have the right idea, but and and the, what's funny is that if, if you tell somebody, hey, don't be cocky, be confident. Okay, coach, that makes sense in the the um, vernacular of the sporting world. I get it. Yeah. But they don't know how to be confident. Yeah, like they, they can't actually do anything with it. Yeah. There's no practical application. Absolutely. Right. They yeah. don't know. Well, how, how, what are the oh, steps okay. to take yeah. to that? Yeah. But it sounds good in our head. All right. Yeah. It sounds awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah. But then you get out there and you go, well, I'm not sure. And it's again, like the kid I talked about with the hustle before the, if you say that and then you go, uh, well, you, you played bad. And then the kid's in his head like, well, I'm just bad. I'm not confident. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. You start creating problems that aren't there. Mm -hmm. Better is to go, Hey, what are the things to make you confident? A lot of reps. Okay. We'll do that. Uh, really just have fun playing soccer. 
Yeah. That usually will get you a better outcome. Yeah. That's the, uh, what was that movie with? Uh, Tom Cruise. And, no, yeah. Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Remember where he, that, that's how he helped, that's how he helped the guy. Was it Cooper Gooding Jr.? Who yeah. was it? Yeah, yeah. He just got him back to having fun with yeah. football. That's the thing. Because he was doing, he, was, he had been really great and then he got horrible. But it's because he was so focused on the money yeah, yeah. and the outcome and winning that he wasn't enjoying football anymore. Absolutely. And when Jerry Maguire helped him have fun, then he got, got good again. Yeah, absolutely. It, like you, what you do, jumping out of a plane, there will probably never be a time where you jump out of a plane where you're like, eh. <laughs> you know, well, how long does this last? You yeah. know, like, I'm hungry. You yeah. know, it's, can we get down faster? Because that's kind of lame. Like, Did I leave the oven on? Yeah, right. So... <laughs> Your, again, yours has that forcing function, but yeah, that's, that's common. We get so caught up in um, our expectations or other people's expectations mm -hmm. that we aren't in the moment performing. Yeah. All right. Um, so do you want to talk about, I have two different things on my, on my mind right now, um, like struggle and failure mm -hmm. or like brain free, like where, you, where your brain, you, you're in the moment, you're trying to do something. And, and it's like you just brain fart. Okay, okay, let's start there. With that one? Yeah. Okay, so the other day I was, I was jumping and um, I, I just had this moment. I, I was, <clears throat> the jump went well, but then I was under canopy and- Who's canopy? <laughs> <laughs> she sounds and, cute. And, uh, <laughs> And I, <laughs> so like brain freeze like right now. Exactly. Exactly. No, okay. So I'm flying my canopy uh -huh. and I found myself out of position okay. to where I needed to most drop zones. We do a left hand landing pattern. Um, and it's very similar to the way that airplanes will fly a landing pattern. And, um, you got a, a downwind crosswind and then final. And most drop zones do a left-hand pattern. It doesn't matter. Some, some don't, whatever. That's not the point. But so I needed to be, um, I needed to be in this certain spot to start that pattern. Well, I was jacking around a couple different things. It doesn't matter, but I was out of position. I was too low to get to that point where I needed to be to start that landing pattern and not mess everybody else up, get in the way. I mean, I could have just cut across Right, but it would have been dangerous. I would have cut people off. I, that wasn't an option. And for some reason in the moment, my brain, I'm looking at the landing area, I'm noticing other canopies in the sky, but I just, my brain stopped working is what it felt like. Uh -huh. To where I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't make a decision uh -huh. about what was the best course of action from where I was at. Now I had already made a couple bad decisions to get in this spot, but then from there I was like, ah, uh, and it was, I'm getting lower and lower and lower. It's getting worse and worse. And all of a sudden I just decided to do something and it was much more dangerous. It was much, it was very dumb. It, it was not, anyway, I landed. I can't say without incident because it was an incident. I wasn't hurt. I didn't hurt anybody else. I didn't hurt myself, but it was really dumb and it was a terrible decision. So as I'm le sitting there in the grass, um, and people are like making sure I'm okay because it was just a really dumb landing. Anyways. Were they like, are you okay, dummy? Yeah, they should have been. <laughs> um, almost, I mean, very quickly, I landed. I kind of gathered myself, realized I was not hurt. I was okay. Mm -hmm. And then almost within 10 seconds, my brain cleared and I knew exactly what I should have done. Like mm -hmm. I had the easiest option available to me, mm -hmm. the easiest thing. All I had to do was turn my canopy into the wind and land like that. It would have been safe. It would have been easy. I wouldn't have been inconvenienced. It was like such an obvious thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, my brain just, is like it stopped working. Brain freeze, brain, brain fart. <laughs> uh, the, the, the idea that, um, you lose, it's not an idea. Here's, it's a physiological process. You're in fight or flight. I would imagine if you were to retrace that jump, mm -hmm. if, if, or if you could, you know, Tom Cruise movies where like a computer, like you just, all the screens are floating in the air and you're moving yeah. it around. If you could recategorize everything and see thought to thought, you would probably see an increasing story you were telling yourself about your own failure, about panic, about danger, about whatever. 
triggering a fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So when fight or flight happens in the brain, prefrontal cortex where rationality and logic and, and reason live is completely taken offline. So the primitive part of your brain, the amygdala takes over to help you survive. So the part where thinking happens is offline. That's why you couldn't think straight. Mm. Generally speaking, when that's plucked, it's about a 40 minute window till the chemicals go back to normal, till we're back in, in normal thing. You, you, for whatever reason you land, maybe because you're out of danger, 10 seconds later, you're back to your prefrontal cortex and you're thinking clearly. Mm -hmm. It is 100% a reaction to perceived threat mm. every time. Makes sense? So yeah. we, we, just yeah. can't acu we just can't access rationality. Is there a way to, when that happens, and I, if, let's say a person could actually recognize that that's happening. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that I'm not thinking clearly, that I'm, is there a way to the first, like counteract that? or, or yeah, the, the best thing is to, is to be proactive in it and really stick to your process. See mm -hmm. how everything comes back to process and outcome? Yeah. Your process got screwy. Right. You got out of your link to your wire, your, your, yeah. What I normally do. Yeah, your behaviors, you panicked. Yeah. You maybe didn't panic, maybe that's a strong word, but you no, went, uh oh, but, now I have to start thinking. Yeah, panic in the sense that my, my, my thought process Yeah, you, your expectations weren't met all of a sudden, now you had to introduce thought, and you, there's a lot, you're, you're a forcing function of falling from a plane, so there's a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. Yeah. And so when it happens, mm -hmm. falling to earth, plummeting to earth it's probably going to be the hardest place to turn that around well this was when i was flying my canopy but same same concept that, that's, to my mind that's still <laughs> plummeting to earth okay. <laughs> um so the the in general the first thing to do when you, is to be aware that it's happening uh-oh yeah. side sidetracked mm -hmm. then probably have a performance plan built into place in case that happens so maybe learn from that experience and next time go, hey, if things go sideways, what's the thing I can do to bring me back to the present fastest? Yeah, my so toes. what would that be? What? I, that's up to you. I can't tell you. It has to be in your brain. Because I mean, what, what, give, me a, give me an example. Wiggle, wiggle your toes. Oh. What do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? Smack my mouth. Whatever. Whatever it takes. And, and that little... What's seven times seven? 49. Boom. You were acutely present. You were... Maybe it's that, huh? You, because you got back to to here. Okay, seven times seven. Okay, maybe do a harder one. Well, what's twelve times nineteen? Twelve. You just got prefrontal. You don't even have to figure out the problem. Yeah, because I can tell you what what your your um, analysis of the situation was dead on. Because I was, I, I know it. I mean, I can think back to what I was thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh shoot, I had all these negative, I had all these thoughts of the the all the possible negative outcomes. Uh -huh. That's all I could think about was, uh -huh. well, I, I might, I might, oh, I'm gonna have to cross the runway super low. That's not, I can't do that, that's not safe. Oh, I'm gonna get, look at those people over there, I'm gonna get in their way and we're gonna have an in-air collision, I can't do that. I'm gonna land, you know, all I was thinking about was all the things that I didn't want to happen. So a way to- And I never, I never stopped to be like, hey, what are my options? What's the best option? I never did that. Okay, so, I'm not saying this would work in the air, but probably next time learning from experience, something goes south, go and that second, what's my best option and bail out. No pun intended mm -hmm. versus your natural monkey brain. Here's how I'm going to die. Here's how I'm going to die. Here's how I'm going to die. Here's how I'm going to kill somebody else. What's my best option and do it. Yeah. And some of them weren't even like how I'm going to die or get hurt. It was just, uh, I'm gonna not land where I want. You know, it was like stupid reasons. Like, oh, I'm gonna have to walk far. Or, I mean, really, really dumb. Well, you were, you were exploring every possible outcome. Yes, yes. And some of them were super scary. Some of Which, them were just annoying. And every super scary one has death attached. So it, it, it's gonna suck your attention. Yeah. Let's not die. Mm -hmm. But so conditioning yourself, things went south, best option. However that sentence would manifest in your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I, I was just reminded of a story when I was in high school, <clears throat> this lady, you know, Kerrville and from, so from interstate 10, she had exited off of interstate. No, no, that's not right. She was coming in on highway 16 from Fredericksburg uh -huh. and it, it just runs right into Kerrville. You know, I mean, it turns yeah. into Sydney Baker. So she's coming in on highway 16 and, um, I think she had her grandkid with her or something. 
um, driving some kind of like station wagon or sedan or something. And so she's going like 55 miles an hour because that's highway, the highway. As she comes into town, she gets close to that first, there's a first stoplight, wherever it was at that time, I don't know where the first stoplight was, but she lets her foot off the gas and her accelerator was stuck. So she's going 55 and letting her foot off the gas, the car is not slowing down at all. Well, so she starts trying to push the brake, but the accelerator is, is still stuck, so she can't slow down. And she panicked. And I, I can remember we were at soccer practice at the stadium, and we see this car. We hear this car go by, because it's right there next to the road. I mean, she goes flying by like 55 miles an hour right there in the middle of town. She made it all the way down to like um, where that Chicken Express is now. You know where that chicken is? Mm -hmm. um, she made it all the way to that intersection before she just T-boned another car. And I think three people ended up dying. She mm -hmm. survived, um, but it was a horrible, horrible wreck. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going home that day and finding out what had happened. And my, my dad, we were talking and he's like, he actually set me down. He's like, hey, what would you have done in that situation? I was like, well, I don't know. And he goes, well, think about it. What are all the different ways that you can make a car slow down? What could you do? I was like, well, I guess you could, I guess you could just turn off the key. And he's like, yeah, you could do that. That would definitely stop the engine, but then you'd lose power brakes. You'd lose power steering. The steering wheel might lock up. Like, what else could you do? I was like, um, I don't know. I guess you could stick your foot under the accelerator and try to pull it up. He's like, yeah, that might work. And he goes, what about just putting the car in neutral? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. super easy, super simple. Yeah, your engine's gonna rev like crazy. It might damage the engine. So what? Yeah. Would you rather have a ruined engine or have a terrible car wreck where three people die, right? But in that moment, and I can totally understand, like in a sense, you can't fault the lady because she panicked. Yeah, and when you panic, you panic. I mean, yeah. you're just, you're not thinking straight. Um, so luckily that day for me, skydiving, it wasn't so much of a panic that I freaked out, mm -hmm. but I did make bad decisions. And it was a series of bad decisions because I was, I think, like you said, overly focused on all these outcomes rather than just stop what's the best option yeah the the thing you bring up that's interesting though is your dad talking you through that it's the the power of visualization we talked about earlier your brain mm. doesn't know the difference so you just practice that scenario three times yeah and now in your prefrontal cortex beep boom beep things are lining up yeah you now have a well to draw from mm -hmm. speaking of the well that is experience even yeah. though it's in your head yeah it is not I have no, nothing to compare this to, brace yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you had have uh, what happened to you during that jump, probably on your first solo jump, it would have had a way different outcome Yeah, because you have a lot of experience making micro decisions to keep yourself alive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just practicing now, like I said, like you go, well, what can you do? We just practice it in your head. Mm -hmm. Next time that goes south, this is going to be what I'm going to do. Yeah. It's simple. It doesn't mean it's going to work, but it gives you a lot better chance. Yeah. So what, what was the well thing that you were talking about? So I don't even remember what was we were on this context for, but um, I feel like, okay, it was about, you were talking about the retreat you went on and, and what your experience was and this, this guy telling you different zones of whatever, right? Um, so I don't know if you've ever read or listened to Tony Robbins. Yeah, a little bit. I, I like Tony Robbins. He's, he's dynamic and I like what he does. He's great, great what he does. But if you read his book, he's just putting different names on wisdom that already exists. Mm -hmm. He's not creating that. Yeah. Neither am I. Yeah. That's what we talked about. Right. You know? um, so I've had this like vision or whatever, this little flash multiple times that there is a, there's a, the, the image of my mind comes from Istanbul, Turkey. When I was a kid, we went visited there. Underneath, there's an old uh, Roman aqueduct. That okay. used to be the city's water and you could take a little boat on it so it's all these roman columns you're underground crystal clear water you can see the bottom it's really cool i think of it that way there's this underground like cistern of universal knowledge mm. it's god it's allah buddha tom cruise whoever you believe to be the thing right and we all have access to it mm. but some people tony robbins you know the people we admire whatever have a Oprah, I don't know, whoever, have some um, just natural well of it. But I feel like the wisdom of that, that universal wisdom is most attainable to us in the present moment. 
And the more present we are day to day, the more access we have to the well of universal knowledge, wisdom, experience. Mm. This kind of comes full circle, everything we talked about, taking somebody else's experience, making it your own. I feel like everything there is to know already exists in this cistern Mm -hmm. that presence gives us access to. Mm. There's a lot of times in a conversation like this when I'm working with people where stuff is coming out of me I've never thought of before yeah, yeah. that is exactly what it's supposed to be in that moment. Mm-hmm. So I'm not trying to say, I channel Tom Cruise, <laughs> right? I just, something happens and I have access to something mm-hmm. that I'm not, I don't even know that I have in my head. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, so then there will be spiritual teachers or teachers like the guy you're talking about, and it could be Christian, it could be Buddhist, it could be whatever who have taken this universe, like from a Christian perspective, it's the wisdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. And they've taken it and put their own stink on it. They use their own words, but those people who who are, are, they become teachers, uh, of significant teachers, Mm -hmm. are the people that have access to that because they just have figured out one way or another to be present. Mm. Yeah. So so I I don't know if, if you, as you chew on that and try to assimilate it, the people that you do not get much wisdom from, mm-hmm. you do not who do not offer much in, in that thing, are never very present people. Mm. Yeah, I, I can. I'm thinking about people. You know, those you have conversations with people, and you can tell when they're there with you. Yeah, and they are they are asking questions. It seems like they care in a different way. Yeah, it, it's a different type of questioning and asking and talking and conversation and and what's weird is that you may even still be talking about something that's not super deep it doesn't have to be a deep topic but it's just a different conversation versus someone who's just running their mouth or something yeah. you know and i i've been on i've been both sure, myself too i mean there's sure. plenty of times where yeah. i'm just running my mouth yeah like saying be confident don't be cocky you know yeah. <laughs> i was just running my mouth you know, I'm it's, the it's, greatest coach it, ever. No, but what's really interesting is that you, you that you're able to quickly identify the the cliche nature of that. Mm-hmm. Like that's what cliche, it's like it's it, it just has no depth. It yeah, it's no, just something we all say and yeah. we all play ball with it because we all say it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. of course. Well, and even when I said that, a couple of the parents heard me and later they're like, "Hey, thanks for saying that. You know, yeah. that was really." Good. <laughs> I was like, it made me feel good. I was like, yeah, it was good, right? They introduce you. This is Chris. He's our soccer coach. He's so wise. He said, don't be cocky. Be confident. He says crap that actually doesn't even help our kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, it's interesting. And so you could be super enlightened, but still say dumb stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah still be sure. victim of a cliche. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's... It, this, is, this brings up a, a whole new interesting dynamic. I feel like my ability to do that is a natural ability I have. Since I was a kid, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because, and I don't mean to minimize autism in any way, shape, or form. I sometimes feel autistic. And that I can hear, I, I think you, you, I know you have this too. You may have never thought about it. It's our whole system does. That you can hear something for what's being said literally, mm-hmm. but then hear all the nuance. Oh. That it could be something else or how you could make it funny. Yeah. Like well, looking at that map and going, it's weird that there's some big thing up there. <laughs> like it's a map. Yeah. But then I go, well, how could I see that different? Yeah. I just can't help but do that. Yeah. And so I think like we talked about before, when we weren't filming that like we have these um, wirings that serve us and our purpose and then the people we uh, influence, but so do they. Mm. And then they all kind of combine into something great. Yeah. But you would never be funny if you couldn't see things apart from their literal nature. Yeah. You know who's awesome at that? Who? Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Dude, he does that. I know. So well. He blows my mind. Yeah. The way that he can reinterpret something to mean something is just, it's so awesome. That, and that's what makes him so funny, is that he pulls out the unexpected. Yeah. You're, you're totally expecting him to take you down this path, and then he and shows you something else. It's just so awesome. That may speak to your kind of thing about being in, in your level of inquiry about stuff. Mm. So like earlier when I first got here, I was looking out at the chickens. I was like, okay, there's some chickens. And my, my, literally my first thought was like, I wonder if fox has come around. Because my experience in my neighborhood, somebody had chickens and a fox started showing up. Yeah. And then I was like, look at all those little birds in there. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, okay, well, there's a lot of little birds. They Then I go, 
what if uh, the, the cage was for little birds and the chickens came secondary? Like, that's <laughs> funny. Like, that's that inquiry where yeah. you just don't take things at face value. Mm-hmm. And so that's goofy and it makes us funny. I, uh, Kenzie, my kid, always talks about how she loves to sit around and listen to us go off on incredibly stupid things. Yeah, we say the dumbest stuff. <laughs> and I think about a time many years ago where it was like me, Raymond, your dad, you, probably your brother, probably Michael Sharp. We went on for a good hour and a half about bacon. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Like, bacon's never not good. What if everything was made of bacon? Because <laughs> your dad brought a bag of bacon with them to wherever we were, which is funny in and of itself. And we were all thrilled, probably. Yeah, like, bacon? Oh, my God. You just don't expect to have bacon when you're sitting there, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, while the, the byproduct or the, the, the icing on the cake is that you can take that skill and make it funny, that's probably part of your purpose, my purpose, is mm. that we have that ability to, we have the desire to inquire. Yeah. Oh, that sounded good. Desire, desire to inquire. It's yeah. um, a cliche. Yeah, so um, you're still a little bitter about that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Did we... But that, that, that goes, that, that I think links a little bit with the thing I was talking about coaching and, and being too nice, mm-hmm. knowing how to be a good coach and yeah. how, to, how to push with the right amount, you know, pushing people forward, getting on to them without, without wagging the finger, without yelling and screaming and yeah. cussing them out and all that. But like my desire for people around me to just have fun. Like I want people to be having fun and having a good time. And sometimes that, that I think gets in the way. I'm, I'm too focused on everybody having fun that I'm not actually helping. Like in that, in that regard, like, let's say I'm supposed to be coaching them and helping them get better. <clears throat> but I'm focused on them having fun. Well, that's not what they ask me to do, you know? Yeah, but if you approach that mm-hmm. analytically, you want them to have more fun. Mm-hmm. Well, really, that means you want them to win more. You want well, more success. Well, or just be, be, be better, or learn what they want to learn, or yeah, not so, necessarily competition, but... Well, but it is, because we talked even in, at the why. Yeah. They know who wins, and so you have more fun when you win. Okay. Right? Yeah. And yeah. again, I'm, yeah. I'm Mr. Don't Be Outcome Focused, but it's more fun to win than it is to lose, especially every sure. game. Sure, yes, yeah. So you want to have more fun. Okay, so then it's your job as a coach or your, it would help you to go, what, what, is the, what are the components of fun? Mm-hmm. Winning, team stuff, the pizza, CC's pizza after, whatever it is, and build into those things to create more fun, but then you also affect that outcome. Mm-hmm. So it's not to pacify failure by trying to be fun. Mm-hmm. It's about learning to building up the things that makes playing sports fun. Incorporate the building yeah. blocks of fun. Yeah. yeah. Versus trying to soften the blow of sucking. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, we were talking a minute ago uh, off camera, but we didn't, we didn't really get into it very much. And so I want to hear more like the place for struggle and failure within all, all of this, like sports psychology and growth and development and pushing yourself and learning, comp- all that stuff, right? Like um, struggle and failure. Both necessary to improve. If you don't struggle or fail, you won't improve. Mm-hmm. I'm doing pretty good, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I like to tell people in order to be the best competitively at what they do, go find ways to have your ass handed to you. That's it. Because you're already good at whatever the thing is and you're, you're dominant. Uh, what, what, what challenge is there? What spurs, what motivates you to get better? Nothing. Mm. I'm there. And so then you may, you may continue to practice and hone your skills, but you're not bumping up against stuff. So find ways to lose. Failure. People, people um, think of failing as failure. When you fail, it's an opportunity. It's information. Here's what I could have done better. You can either try again, try harder, or try something new. Most people quit at failure. Failure and obstacles are a 100% guarantee of a high-functioning life. And most people avoid them because of the psychological and emotional response versus approach them and experience the bad feelings. Mm -hmm. So that it all goes to mindfulness. It always does. Go approach the hard thing. Don't get caught up in your story about my ego is not good if I fail. Uh, have your ass handed to you and get better and then go find some other place to have your ass handed to you. Mm. Have you there's a, one of, a newer Ryan Reynolds movie, um, The Atom Project. Mm-hmm. Have you seen it? Mm-hmm. Remember when he, he tells 
himself as a little boy. He basically, he yeah. convinces him to go fight that guy and he just gets beat to crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he, he basically says to himself, like, you had to, you had to lose that fight. Yeah. Like, you had to. Yeah. That was, that, if you want to, you see who I am right now, like, that's what he says. You see what I've become, what we become? Well, that's how that's you, how get, you there. get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the thing about failure is it's feedback mm. to how well you're doing. I failed. I'm not doing well. What do I need to do to build into the missing components? If you do not have that, you're not going to, you're not going to progress. Yeah. I see it all the time in very high functioning athletes in the high school realm. They are so good and their heads and sh head and shoulders above other people. They don't get as much instruction. They get mm -hmm. a lot of attention, but mm -hmm. their mistakes are like, oh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. you know, I saw it a lot in volleyball. Don't worry about it. You're starving. And when uh, adversity hits, when they get to college mm. or the pro level, because everybody's that good, they haven't built in that mechanism to deal with adversity because they have never had it. Mm. So you want as much adversity as you can, especially under your control, because that sharpens you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so real quick, book, books that you would recommend. Okay, uh, did we get the stuff I said before? Yeah, I, I don't know, just say them again. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, not sports psychology specific, but amazing about mindfulness and presence and a lot of, sits under a lot of what we talked about. Carol Dweck, Mindset, um, Fix versus Growth Mindset. Martin Seligman, Learned Optimism, because optimism or pessimism is a choice. It's a preference, it's a, it's a habit. And uh, then my overall thing for any podcast, book, anything that you absorb information, don't get uh, information that continues to root you in your problem, root you in your problem. So for example? Like if uh, you have social anxiety, I've read five books on social anxiety. Why? You, you already got it nailed. Yeah, <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> read, read a book on how to meet people. Mm. So, so read a book about solutions because we stay focused on our problems. Mm. And it's just, I see so many people clinically that, that know everything there is to know about their problem, but nothing about their solution. Yeah. So find things that motivate you to move out of the problem versus stay in the problem. Okay. Because self-help books, <laughs> if you think about it, if they worked, there would only be one, <laughs> right? The first one would have been like, well, we don't need anything else. <laughs> the problem is they have a lot of aha moments and good ideas, but they don't teach you to implement. So find things to pull you forward versus to keep you stuck. Yeah. You go, oh, that makes so much sense, but you don't get instruction on how to move forward. Yeah. Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, that's okay. good. Um, so just, just to wrap up, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this, man. Of course. I, I love this. I could sit here and talk me too. all day. I hope, it's, I hope it's beneficial for everybody watching. Yeah, me too. Um, but I, I do want to share a little bit about, so Dr. J, do you um, do you have a website? MindRightSportsPsychology.com. MindRightSportsPsychology.com. Correct. Uh, and that has links to everything. Okay. Uh, my sports psychology book for parents, my blog, uh, social media. I'm sure is on there. Okay. And then I'm going to put in the in the description of this video. I'll put those books that you listed. Cool. I'll put your website. Um, and then, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, just thanks so much, man. It's super fun. Yeah. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> All right.